Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our, I guess, Easter weekend, our little lecture about the sun today. And first off, thank you for being here with me. I know I mentioned this last week, and um, I hope to do this on YouTube, but I just thought it'd be better to do it here with you guys where the streaming seems a little bit easier at this point. Um, but this will be available on YouTube um, in the coming days. So I won't be mentioning your member names when I take questions at the end. So don't worry about that. And this is not necessarily an exclusive presentation today. It is just a presentation where we get to interact with each other and then I will upload it on, on YouTube probably as soon as I can edit that and put it up there in the next couple of days. So there is a little PDF companion guide that goes with this presentation and I believe that Wolf is just putting that in the comments now so that you can basically see what topics are being covered and sort of what we're going to get into. Today is going to be a really interesting presentation. I was so excited to do this for you guys all week. I was like, I want to do it today because I've just been diving so deeply into the sun and solar consciousness and all of these different aspects of the sun from, it, from its physical effect on us to our its spiritual effect to various different sun cults and the spiritual elements behind it. And so it's going to be so much fun today and I'm just so glad to be here with you to do it. So basically today we're going to be covering everything from the role of the sun in evolution and to what it means to various different beings that have been from the sun and, and what solar consciousness is. And we're also going to touch on Christ consciousness and really beginning to explore you know, what does Christ consciousness mean? And how does Christ consciousness connect with the sun, with solar consciousness and solar energy? And how does our body and our Christ consciousness connect with the sun? Um, so we're going to get into that. And also the ascension body, or of course this weekend, the resurrection body, which is also um, through my guides and my work is sometimes called the Venus body or the mercurial body um, since those planets were switched. And also near the end in part three, we're just going to fly it open and we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about talk about inoculations we're going to talk about some visions I had in regards to that we're going to talk about some current narratives that we see um, on the news and the mainstream about the sun we're going to talk about the planet Mars we're going to talk about the future so this is going to be covering all of our bases and and um it's going to be really good. And we're also going to talk about a little bit from Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, a little bit from Edgar Cayce, and a little bit from Theosophy and Blavatsky, just to kind of go into some already established mystics work about the sun. All right. So, and I want to hear your answers in the chat. What is the sun to humanity? What is the sun to humanity? So the sun is a source of warmth and light and energy. That's sort of obvious. It's been associated with, um, you know, crops and following the growing season for a long time. We know that. The sun is a source of spiritual energy. And it is it releases a specific frequency of light to humanity. Oh, okay. So there's a physical effect of the sun that warms us and that creates certain chemical reactions in, in on the earth. But there's this spiritual personality or spiritual element of the sun. And it's a specific frequency of light. And this specific frequency of light that is emitted from the sun has an effect on humanity, a spiritual effect on humanity. This light from the sun tunes human consciousness so that it evolves with the cosmos. 
And so when it tunes us, we can evolve, humanity can evolve with the momentum of the universe, with the cosmos, not going separate, not going divergent, but with. So we can see that the sun is an initiating force for humanity. It is a type of light that initiates humanity. What else is the sun? Well, the sun is a stargate. I suppose all suns, in a way, are stargates. And the ancients knew the frequency of light. They knew what the stars meant. They knew how stars had to be linked together in certain chains to leave this solar system or to go interdimensionally. And so suns were also viewed in a larger perspective as things that you could align with vibrationally and travel through. Another interesting thing about the sun, there are beings in the sun sphere or sun beings or sun consciousness. And our ancestors believed so many different religions, many different temple cultures held as a tenant that our soul was perfect in the sun. So many ancient religions, especially in the Tibetan religion, this was very strong, um, that our soul had this aspect within it that resonated directly with our sun. So there was an aspect of moving light and energy within our soul that we contained that was ours, that resonated directly with the sun. And that that was our most pure part of ourselves. So we, have, we all have a solar aspect, if you will. And they believed that life was all about how to, how to, how to enmesh with that solar aspect. I guess in, in modern new age, we would call that our higher self. How do we enmesh with that aspect? How do we get that aspect flowing with us? How do we align with that aspect? And that's what a lot of early temple cultures were all about. And then when you think about that, that starts to make a lot of sense as to what a lot of sun cults were. A lot of people think that sun cults were worshipping the sun. Like, oh, oh, sun, please come out today so that we can have a good crop or so that we can, you know, dry up all the rain or sort of kind of this almost like childish and fantile idea of what, a, what the sun cults were. When in reality, they were perhaps trying to connect with a higher version of ourself or a higher version of the collective, of, of the collective consciousness, okay? And of course, one of the reasons why we are doing this talk today is because one of the most recent avatars, who is Jesus Christ, is associated with the sun, and he is uh, by many considered to be a solar deity or a sun avatar or being directly interlaced with the sun. And we can see that because Christ's life follows the major events of the sun. Whatever major event um, of the sun happens, it's also a major event in, in, in Jesus Christ's life. Okay, so we're going to get into that a little bit deeper later on. So... Let's go a little bit deeper into how the sun initiates humanity. So basically, if we were to understand one thing about our sun, and we're sort of moving in as a culture into, I would say, a more scientific view of our consciousness, um, as Rudolf Steiner would say, is spiritual science, and as many other people have been craving for sort of spirituality to move out of dogmatism and out of sort of, I guess, airy-fairy, ungrounded, new agey spiritual beliefs and into something tangible that we can all measure, that we can all look at, that we can all share, um, that isn't attached to various different dogmatic things or ungrounded things that are Luciferian. So part of this is going to come through understanding the sun and understanding light and understanding how humanity works with light and vibration, also magnetism and things like that. But light is going to be a very big part of ushering that in. And of course, we cannot talk about light without talking about our sun. 
So our sun initiates humanity by emitting higher dimensional codes of light or higher light codes that activate humanity, that activate human DNA, that create changes in humanity. And now this may seem sort of strange or sort of crazy, but as we're going to discuss here today, there are studies that have talked about this on the scientific side. And then there's, there's also been people um, in the mystical community that have seen the sun do this to humanity over and over and over again, and these have been recorded, and we'll also get into those today. So one of the things that allows our sun to work in such an incredible interdimensional, multidimensional capacity is the fact that our sun is not standing alone in the sky in its radiance. It is not. It is actually part of something that is called a solar chain. A solar chain is kind of like the idea that you see in anthroposophy or theosophy or in Eastern mysticism, where they have planetary chains that where planetary bodies or spheres are linked together to show the evolution of consciousness within humanity. Now the same thing actually exists when we when we look at our sun. The same thing ha it, the same thing exists with suns. Although when we're looking at the sun and the solar chains or solar trinities really, solar triangles is what they're really more likely called, there we're talking about much larger swaths of energy and really completed star systems or we're talking about a massive expression of the universe, whereas when we're talking about our sun and a solar system, we're just talking about one sun and a solar system. But when we're talking about several different stars, we're talking about huge expressions of consciousness that go in and out of time where we are, and that you have to be pretty balanced in your energy to be able to perceive that light and put it in the right place. So this is not often talked about in mysticism, not for a very long time. The trinity of suns and the different dimensional energies the suns and stars have and how they play together has not been a teaching that has been told for a very long time. Just because our consciousness has become so dense and so materialistic that it's not something that we necessarily grasp. Like if we don't know how to appreciate our own planet and how to live symbiotically with it if we don't understand um, the time that Mars is holding and the time and energy that that Venus and Mercury is holding then it's unlikely that we're really going to have enough information to understand um, the suns as multi-dimensional gates however over the last 20 years, there have been many, many souls incarnating that are able to process this information more and more. And don't get me wrong, there were people always able to understand the chains of suns. There's always been people on the planet that have been able to understand this information, but it just wasn't a majority. And now we are seeing more and more people that are incarnating um, that understand this. So this is why this information is coming out now. And also understanding the understanding the keys of the stars is part of creating a more scientific, um, metaphysical, genuine metaphysical approach to spirituality. Um, so it's it's very objective and it's it it it's really something that the human the individual can work directly with that light and that energy without necessarily needing to have a guru or anything like that when you start getting into understanding cosmic consciousness and what the stars mean and what the planets mean you really start getting to a level of autonomy with your psychic development that is very good okay when we, in other words, when we lost the ability to understand the stars, understand the constellations and the time that they're keeping and the swaths of human consciousness that they are that they are uh, containing, um, we lost a lot of our multidimensional consciousness. So as we retrace that time, as we retrace that pathway back into our higher dimensional consciousness, we will begin to understand what stargates are again. We're going to understand what our sun is again, the higher suns that it is connected to. 
Okay. So sun systems. So our sun is actually part of a larger system of suns. So you can see it as our sun moves in tandem with other suns. Okay, it's part of a system of suns that relay information to each other. So we have our sun here, which is the perfect light and information for this time. And it's translating and it's giving us information. And then we have suns above it that are a different frequent frequency of light. And that light represents a different dimensional scale or a different density. And they communicate with one another the information and the happenings that are going on within that, den that, within that density. So through the suns, we know exactly what is going on throughout the various different dimensions and densities. So the suns communicate and radiate to each other a light language or solar language that is relaying the information that's going on around the solar systems that they feed and support. And the solar systems, so all of the planets, all of the moons, all of the asteroids, whatever is part of that solar deity, that solar energy, is an expression of that light. And it is orbiting and it is moving with that energy. Okay, and every planet is an expression of the sun or it is a embodiment of the sun in a certain time of its development, or it is an embodiment of human consciousness at a certain point. Okay, so you could say there are certain Mars eras on Earth or Venusian eras on Earth, and you can get into these different eras or different types of consciousness that those planets actually genuinely energetically vibrate and can be psychically tapped into. So we have our sun that basically is a, trans, a transponder, a transcoder of higher light that exists in suns that are in higher spheres. So our sun really keeps us, I would say, in line with what is going on in higher densities, what information is going on there and what is being radiated from the Godhead. Because we really don't want to fall out of alignment with our sun. If we fall out of alignment with our sun, what happens? Well, we can't get the information that's coming from the higher worlds, the higher, the higher spheres. We need our sun to digest and transcode the information from higher dimensions and radiate it down to us. Okay, so if we lose the radiance of our sun, the pure radiance of our sun, we're losing information that we need to be radiated onto us to receive so that we can go through changes within our consciousness with the rest of the cosmic system. And if you are familiar with my Christ stream lecture, this is the organic evolution organic evolution comes through the sun okay it's very important to it's very important that we understand this the spiritual role of the sun okay another way that we can look at the sun is as a 5d stargate or a fifth dimensional stargate and um, if you are a fan of the Isis Rising series, the first several episodes, um, they discuss this. They discuss the star body. They discuss the um, role of the sun and uh, solar light. So long story short there, our sun is what you, we would understand as a stargate that leads human consciousness into 5D. Now this is a new age term, um, but it is a good term, um, 5D, because what it really represents is 
pre-fall consciousness. When people start talking about 5D energy and sort of 5D uh, waves that are coming to humanity or like a 5D earth or 5D humanity, what they're really talking about is humanity embodying its higher self. They're talking about a quality of the human being that is pre-fall. So before we fell into the third dimension, um, we had a certain higher frequency. That frequency was 5D. And it is a deeply psychic and connected state. There's a lot less um, fear and pain and, and you know, 3D is a very, very hard school to incarnate into. So once we fall out of that, we come into 3D, we experience individuality, we experience all of that individuation, and then we come, we begin to come full circle, usually at the end of an era or end of an age, and we merge right back up with that 5D consciousness. Now this arc in our time, in our situation, represents the development of the human mind, the ability to analyze, the ability to think critically, the ability to do calculations, the ability to um, form your own opinion, the ability to discern. This is all something that we are learning because even though before, when we were in our pre-fall state, we didn't have the development of mind. We didn't have the ability to analyze how something happened in the world. We just knew how it happened. We didn't formulate our own opinions. We just kind of telepathically shared them. And so we are coming back to our pre-fall level of consciousness. The frequency is the same but we're coming through it from a place of mastery, if you will. We're coming through it with talents and gifts and a level of um, power that we didn't have when we fell. So it is coming full circle, and this is called the organic timeline. This is called organic evolution, okay? And the sun is right at that level. The sun is the stargate and the part of ourselves that is the beacon or the energy that radiates that to us. It's clarifying, it's a pure form of energy and it uplifts us, okay? So we are always in this way, um, we are always sort of tuning ourselves with the sun. The earth is always tuning herself with the sun and making whatever planetary adjustments that she needs to grow with the cosmos. And also, humanity is also tuning themselves with the sun through our etheric body. So we're always tuning with the sun, we're always clarifying, we're always go moving with the sun. And so, we need the sun to stay connected with current time, the organic timeline, and the ability to communicate with our higher self and higher worlds. And as I mentioned before, I think it's good to say this again. Um, there's a good Blavatsky quote in the handout that um, speaks about this. All planetary bodies are an expression of the consciousness of the sun. Okay. All planetary bodies around our sun in our solar system are an expression of the sun. So again, the sun is an all-encompassing light. It's a it's a 5D energy. It's a higher light. So as it as it uh, as we're here in this lower density, we're taking that 5D light that's many different things in one, and we're seeing it extrapolating and taking physical form over time by forming different planetary bodies that are actually an expression of cosmic energy, right? Because it's in a chain, um, and that's actually how our um, solar system is set up. Our solar system is an expression of the sun, and the sun itself is an expression of even higher worlds, right? So when we lose connection with our sun, we lose connection with this organic timeline, okay? So 
I think it's really interesting some of the things when I was um, doing my research for this presentation with you guys. I loved a lot of what um, Blavatsky and early theosophy said about fire. Because you don't really, I love going back to the older teachers that are from the 1800s and even early 1900s because it's very clear that they had a certain language and they had a certain perspective that we're really missing today in, I would say, the new age. Um, and so I love the, the way that um, the early teachers used very traditional language around spirituality and around our kundalini energy. And I love that they called it fire because that is the sun that heat, that fire, that light. I love that because it, it allows us to remember that we are solar beings and the light that we have in part is solar light. You know, that's part of, it's part of who we are. It's part of what we are. It's part of what every planet is. And so I love that we see things in the, um, the theosophical movements and the older mysticism that calls our soul fire, spiritual fire. I love that because there's a huge secret in that. So one of the things that Blavatsky says on the power and symbology of fire is, fire is the most perfect and unadulterated reflection in heaven as on earth of one flame. It is life and death, the origin and the end of every material thing. It is divine substance, divine fire. And that was from the secret doctrine. Here's another really, here, here, here's another quote that I also enjoyed. This is Blavatsky on the sun's role as the mind structure of our solar system. So it's also believed um, in many ancient mystery traditions that the way that one of the best ways we can identify with the sun is to see it as the mind structure, to see it as giving shape, a structure, form, or a logos. Okay? So the sun. We know what it does psychically, which is it gives us all of this light information, changes us, keeps us connected to higher worlds. There's all these spiritual things. But what is the experience of it? It's great to talk about what the energy does and, and discuss that. It's very satisfying. But what does it feel like? How do we relate to it in, in, in a deeper way that's very important with mysticism? So Blavatsky says... Each solar system is the manifestation of energy and life of a great cosmic existence, whom we call, for lack of a better term, solar logos. This solar logos incarnates or comes into manifestation through the medium of a solar system. So we have this really interesting picture of this body of light, and of course we're all light, and it is basically an expression of the Godhead. And you could call that God's mind, or you could call that a logos. It has a structure within it. The sun contains within it a lexicon, a series of archetypes in which it emits into the material realm and that form. And everything is based on this higher, sense of logos even our own sense of even our own sense of i think right or wrong or our own sense of of the universe comes from this i would say very pure form of light that has a it has a tendency to come into our body because it's from a, because it really is a higher light and sober things and clarify things a lot of people will say, once I've, hey, once I've had a day at the beach or I've been outside, I feel a sense of clarity and a sense of peace. 
right? So this is a very important part. It's as though we are it's as though we are merging with a higher entity, a higher mind, and it sort of purifies us in a way. And then you get the images of the purification of fire and burning away what we don't need. There's so much beautiful and incredible solar inner solar imagery and spiritual fire imagery. Um, and of course, the burning away within our etheric body or 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 our energy body doesn't happen because of heat. It happens because of the high intensity of light and information that comes from this higher dimensional light. And it sort of, in a way, dominates the lower energy and says it's because it's more powerful. It's like the Herxheimer effect where it forces darkness out. It's like an alchemy when they have the, I forget what it's called, the dose, I, I don't remember what it's called, but the little bit that burns off that's not necessary. This is what higher light does. It burns off what's no longer necessary, it purifies. But it also, in order for it to do that, in order for it to be a purification force, it has to have information in it that is more true or it has to have information in it that is tr more true than what we have. We're reckoning ourselves with a truth. And that is the power of the sun. So, in summary, our sun, our cosmic body of fire, is a force that digests or transcodes information from higher realities and emits it into this solar system. We need our sun's pure light to attune us to our higher selves and the higher worlds while we are in 3D, while we are on Earth. And our Earth, which is a 3D body, needs the sun's energy to go through the changes that she needs to purify herself and to go through her own evolution. This is how solar systems work, through light, through different densities of light, interacting with one another, exchanging information, and going through points of intense balance and recalibration. Also, our sun is the logos, or the mind, the structure in which our solar system was formed from and follows to this day. We are all made of cosmic fire or cosmic light or prana. And our sun is the external manifestation of that force. When people say everything is connected, everything is connected, we're all connected, everything's connected, yeah. And one of the major connecting bodies is our fire body, our sun. It's one thing to say we're all connected, everything's connected, sure, that's great. But how? What is that higher light force that interweaves with everything, with everyone, that spins in every planet and every person? Sure, it's the Godhead. You could say it's the Godhead, sure, but the Godhead is such a higher dimensional energy that we can't receive light directly that's from the eighth or ninth dimension. It needs to be stepped down in order for us to receive it and have meaning because we have developed bodies moving down through the densities that are for that specific density. And they're denser and denser and denser, and so you need different light depending on the consciousness that you are in. And so you will find that there are different suns for different densities that relay the information of the Godhead to humanity. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about receiving our sun and connecting with our sun. So usually when we talk about receiving our sun or connecting with our sun, we usually think about vitamin D. And that if we are to go outside and let the sun's rays hit us, 
we will get vitamin D. We may get a sunburn if we're if, if we're out. Um, and we just think about like physical solar radiation and its effect on our on our body. So we talk about the physical nourishment of the sun. And this is actually what we would expect for a society that is as disconnected from spiritual reality as it is. Everything becomes about how we physically receive the sun. And like nothing is talked about and how we genuinely receive most of the solar rays and relate to the sun, which is actually through our etheric body or part of our energy body. The biggest part of our receptibility for solar energy is actually not the physical rays of the sun. It's actually your etheric body that receives the sun, but because the sun is such an all-encompassing force, we also can benefit from it physically. But the physical reception of the sun or the ability to hold the sun does not determine the spiritual quality of a person. Um, this is a very materialist perspective, okay? So ideally, in relating to the sun, and this is going to go hand in hand with spirituality, spiritual initiation. All spiritual initiation is about overcoming the material world and no longer being subject to your ego, um, your lower mind and the material world, but rising above it by creating such coherence and balance in your energy body that you are beyond it. And how we do that is actually through working with our sun and, and, and working with light and to get our light body um, functioning very coherently. Okay. Ideally we want to uh, ideally we want to radiate the quality of light that we understand in the sun from the inside out. We want to match the spiritual qualities of the sun inside so that we radiate, we, we are luminous, okay? And the forces of the moon do help us to do this, but we're not radiating the moon. The moon is acting as a catalyst, a catalytic force, but it's really, what we're really matching with is the solar energy. Why? Because the solar energy is stepping down the Godhead's energy, the energy of higher suns for us to digest because we are in a lower density and we need a specific spectrum of light to uplift us. Okay, we're not going to need a seventh density sun. I mean, you, 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 it, it's all very... Um, the creation, the process of creation and dissension is very succinct in that you have a sun that represents a specific density that uplifts and nourishes an entire system, right? And it, it represents the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of humanity and the evolution of the universe with these various suns that contain the consciousness of the, the density that they serve, okay? So we receive solar energy or prana through the energy body or specifically through our etheric body. And it's also distributed to our physical form from our etheric body, which can be seen as um, seen and experienced as sometimes you'll experience it as a bunch of different layers um, or like webs or tendrils. It's, it's like an energy body that's just outside of our physical body. But that's actually where we receive the radiance. And this is because our physical form, you know, our pores and our skin cannot actually necessarily receive the full spectrum. It only receives a certain spectrum. We need our etheric body to receive the spiritual aspect of the energies of the sun. Okay. And we also um, receive solar prana just from being incarnated on the earth and just living on the earth no matter where you live. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, every type of human being has a different um, 
way of physically relating to the sun. But when it comes to what's going on behind the scenes, it's all of our etheric bodies that are really doing the most resonance work with the sun because that actually receives um, a bunch of aspects of the sun's energy that our physical form um, doesn't receive. Okay, and, and part of our life force energy, we could actually see because of this as solar prana. Um, solar prana made physical. And so in, in, in a way, we are sort of like aspects of the sun physicalized. And this is very interesting because a lot of mystics and a lot of yogis have accounts of people that spend their life training themselves to clarify their pain body and um, sort of, I guess, perfect themselves so that they can receive the sun properly. And by doing this, they're able to no longer necessarily eat food and they just live off of basically the sun's energy. Um, they'll sit in the sun for sure and they'll receive aspects of it, but it's what, what really happened is that they've purified themselves so that their etheric body and their, their, their interface is able to receive that life force energy directly. So there are accounts of monks and various people being able to do this. And it obviously takes a lot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend trying to go and do this necessarily. But hey, <laughs> do you. <laughs> um, so... So ideally, when, when it talks about receiving the sun, and when we talk about even kundalini energy, and sometimes you'll hear mystics say things like the body radiance, or the body immortal, you know, the Venus body, um, the resurrection form, the ascension body. What we're really talking about is, the fi is a 5D body or a body, an, ener an energy body that we develop that can handle the light and power of 5D basically without being destroyed uh, under the pressure. And so this is really, now we're really starting to get into it. The, we want to be able to receive prana and we do receive prana from the earth as well. We do receive prana from nature and things like that. But the difference between prana that we would receive in from the earth is there's a level of nourishment to it, but it's the solar prana um, that provides a certain amount of life force fire. It's, it's extremely powerful um, and it is in a different league or a different echelon than lunar energies and even earth energies, which are more um, horizontal in their energy or spreading in their energy. And then the solar energy is much more. We're sort of getting into some cross work here, but you catching my drift? <laughs> so, um, so basically, when we talk about this, and we start getting into your, our kundalini rising, the idea of building a solar body or, you know, making it so our human body, our physical body is directly in line with our higher self. And these, these conversations are basically why we're here. We're basically here as human beings to have our material form move and act as our spiritual form does. But right now, for the vast majority of us, it doesn't. So why is that? And maybe extending that, why can't we receive the sun properly? What stops us from developing ourselves? What do you guys think? Trauma, pain, and holding incongruent belief systems that do not line up with cosmic law that are not true. No matter how crazy the world gets, there is objective truth. There are cosmic laws, universal laws. 
And there is also, we also have certain truths within ourselves, okay? And there's a certain balance that we have to have as human beings to, I would say, begin to hold the really high vibrations of solar energy. So the one thing that really stops us from receiving and circulating prana is our pain and our trauma. So when we have a bunch of shadows that we don't deal with, we have a bunch of pain that we keep pushing aside and not dealing with, that what that does is it actually clogs up our connections with our etheric body and our higher bodies. It kind of causes like a, a gelling and a blocking, like a congealing or a binding of things. And so our consciousness doesn't move very smoothly on it. And what ends up happening is that solar prana that's coming in, um, it just sort of dissipates or it gets tamped down or, or, or it just gets destroyed because it can't, it, it, it's, we're not prepared for it. Okay. So in order to become a vessel of Christ consciousness, of solar prana, of our higher self, of have a, a 5D body, have a body immortal, we have to earn it. And we have to be dedicated to being honest with ourselves about how we feel, about the aspects of ourselves that need healing. We have to challenge ourselves all the time. We have to become playful. We have to develop critical thinking and critical thought. Because we know that the ego, which is the force that causes a lot of this pain, the lower ego, lies to us and will tell us things in order to, to trick us. We, we know the negative ego is a, is a trickster and will fight to keep us down, right? So we have to be very aware of that and even playful with um, our relationship with ourselves, okay? Because we don't want to block our, our chi, our prana, we want it to circulate in our body. We basically want to live in complete harmony and tandem with nature where we can be here and all of our channels are opening. They're not too open, it's not crazy, but they're also not too closed and we can receive our energy and we can circulate it. And we're moving with the cosmos as we do this. We're moving with ourselves. We're moving with the sun. We're moving forward. We're evolving. We're growing. We want, we, we want to be part of that beautiful tandem movement by not having these blocked um, channels. And so um, being able to um, circulate our prana is very important and the more that we can learn to purely circulate the prana that we have and the prana goes through various different energy centers as you know the chakra systems it goes all the way down comes back up and so it is circulated right so we want it we, we want to be able to do this for a long enough period of time that we actually have a bit of a surplus. So all of this energy isn't being burnt off. And there's lots of different ways that you can burn this off. I'm not gonna get into that in this, in this video. But um, we want that beautifully cycling through us, okay? And as that happens, we can get to a point where there's actually a little bit of a surplus that goes into building and forming a larger body than ourself which is called the body immortal, the resurrection body, the ascension body. Um, I call it the Venus body. Um, let me know in chat right now what other terms there are for this. But these bodies form, this body forms, it's really a 5D capable aspect of ourselves. When we have overcome a great deal of 
our pain and we begin to get into a coherence. And it doesn't happen all right away. This is a journey. So you can develop this over years and years and years and years. And it will be the best thing for your psychic development, right? All psychic, all psychic ability is, is the ability to read higher spectrums of information. So we have to prepare ourselves to do that. But we also have to prepare ourselves to receive higher solar energies as well, okay? So this is a great sort of weekend to talk about this because Christ, Jesus Christ, this is something that he was able to achieve. And we don't often get into the reality of, of how Jesus Christ's energy body was working and flowing. Usually with religion at this point, it's super dogmatic and the genuine mysticism that made Christ who he was is completely ignored. And But at the end of the day, this is something that he was able to do, that he was able to achieve. Um, and so here on this Easter weekend, it's really something interesting to think about. It's interesting to think about how do we develop ourselves so that we can survive death, so that no matter what happens to us, we have this sense of control or we have this powerful force of energy within us that we are not so much subject to the material world. Um, but we are able to transform ourselves consciously through it. And there were times on the planet where, um, there were times on the planet where um, humanity was significantly less dense. Our planet is at a very, 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 very deep state of density and heaviness and, and, and material force. <laughs> compact. But it wasn't always like this. And in temple cultures, one of the main things, if not the main thing that was practiced, was resurrection. Was surviving death. This was what was practiced. This was what was done. It was the most important thing because it meant that your physical form could act as your spirit does. It means that you've overcome the material existence. And as we were just talking, it, it meant that you had cleared yourself of your karma and your pain and your trauma, that it was no longer controlling your mind. It meant that you had built yourself up to resonate with the sun so that you radiate inwardly just like that. It's a big deal. But over time, in the temple cultures, we lost that. We got heavier and heavier and heavier and denser and denser and denser. And we fell farther and farther and farther away from our psychic abilities, from our cosmic memory, and from our true higher selves. And we began to worship the material world as though it is a god. And as we did that, we fell into our lower chakra system and began to deny the heart and compassion and everything became not the positive development of the mind, which is a mind that is anchored in the spiritual cosmic mind, but mind itself almost became a god. A mind that is not anchored in anything holy, just a mind analyzing itself, factoring itself in all the time, making itself God, making analysis God, 
making the room smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and heavier and heavier and heavier. And here we are today, where science is now a religion. And you can read a myriad of serious articles that many people believe that say that the soul doesn't exist. So is it any wonder that only one man was able to resurrect? Is it any wonder why we have such a difficult time when we are incarnated in a collective that denies the very basis, the very beginning part of this? God, it is no wonder. We are not in a fertile time today where people understand what overcoming death is. But our son has maintained the truth and maintained the pattern. And because it is a higher density light, it is pure. And no matter how lost you are, no matter how far you think you are from this journey, this journey of healing ourselves and maybe one day transcending death, we always have our light because the sun's light is not outside of us. It is as much us as well. We always have that as a clarifier. Okay. And so we have our inner sun, if you will, or an inner solar body or an inner solar form, a 5D body. And it is attuned and resonates with that light. And when we develop it, we can not only survive death, but we can also begin to use stargates and things like that. All right. So, in summary, we receive solar energy or life energy through our etheric body. There's often confusion around this where we think that if you get a sunburn or if you have fair skin, you're suddenly not compatible with the sun or there's something wrong with you and this is not the case. You know, the major the art we receive our prana through our etheric body. Um, we, we don't receive our life force through our skin. Um, it's actually a complete energy transference. And I just want to be very clear about that because there's a lot of misunderstandings around this in esoterica today. Okay, so once we receive the life force through um, our energy body, it nourishes us and it clarifies us um, through kind of like a solar, a solar resonating prana. If we have trauma that is undealt with, now if you, we all have trauma, we all have problems, okay? The, the idea isn't that we have to have no problems, okay? The idea is that we are being honest with ourselves about our issues and that we are willing to face our problems. See how there's a difference there? We have to be actively in pursuit of healing and um, practicing self-responsibility, exploring ourselves. We have to be interacting with our spirit. Okay. And if, and it also acts as a clarifier. So it's not just nourishing us. It's important to understand that we don't just receive fire and attunements, it also clarifies things. The sun can be a great clarifier, which is why it's often called the logos, okay? When our prana can pass smoothly through us without all of the sort of, I would say, trauma or even belief systems that are not aligned, right? Even belief systems that aren't exactly true. Those also cause problems when receiving our prana. Woohoo, this is fun, right? But this is what it looks like in our system, okay? So when we have our energy able to move clearly through our system and there isn't a lot of holdups, that's when we start to really develop our resurrection body and be able to do these incredible things, okay? All right, I'm just gonna check to see um, if we have 
um, um, some questions here and I see we have some. I will try to address your questions as we go, um, but I'll probably do the majority of them at the end. So, kind of a simple question. Could you please talk about the truth of wearing sunscreen? There is so much fear going on when it's sunny and I'd like to know the spiritual significance, please. Thank you, big love to you. Well, big love your way. This is a great question. So when it, when it comes to interacting with our sun, as I said, the majority of our interaction with our sun is through our etheric body because our etheric body can receive greater spectrums of energy than our physical body can. So we're not receiving our solar prana through our skin. Now we do need some sunlight. This is obvious. You'll get scurvy if you don't have it. So it's. I'm not saying that we don't benefit from solar light on our skin and that we don't need sunlight. What I'm saying is that the connection and the prana that we receive is energetic first because there's spectrums of energy that our skin does not pick up, okay? When it comes to sunscreen, I've heard a lot of interesting things about this. In a little bit later in this presentation, I will talk about um, receiving the sun with the skin a little bit more. But basically, um, our relationship with the sun has a lot to do with our pain body, okay? Part of our ability to, um, our inability to receive the sun is to do with our pain body, okay? But there's lots of kind of interesting little sidelines about this, okay? All right, so so here's another question I'm going to add in. I'm just going to do this question, and then I'm going to get back onto our talk. Okay, so you say, hi, Gigi. It's interesting that you mentioned fire being talked about a lot with earlier spiritualists. Steiner talks a lot about it. I know. I love it. I want to bring it back, actually. Does it, does this mean, does this mean it, fire, or the state of matter, plasma, was more superior to other elements, states of matter, air, water, earth? It's really, it's, it's a really interesting question. I don't think that you can view any of the elements as superior, as they all work in tandem to create certain functions on the planet. Spiritual fire tends to, um, and, and fire tends to um, stand out because it is such a, it's kind of like a very intense injection of God at times. But spiritual fire really can't exist and we can't really receive it unless we also have a certain amount of water, um, a certain amount of air. And so it's really about balance, but the, but, but the fire tends to almost germinate in these other elements. It's a way of why people tend to worship it and why people tend to hold it in such high regard is because it is a force that tends to connect us to other things, to our higher self, whereas some of the other elements tend to be more gestating or holding a space. So they all absolutely work together and nothing works unless we know the quantities and, and how to work with it. As we know, if you know in ceremonial magic that that's a big deal, the elements are a big deal. Okay. So I wouldn't say that um, that um, it's superior, but I would say it's highly regarded um, to human beings because it tends to be very dramatic and obvious, okay? So some things that happen to us when we start to um, have that solar energy move through us is we start to get psychic development going. We start to evolve. Um, we start to have certain psychic organs start to awaken. 
Because again, when you are taking responsibility for your shadow, when you're challenging yourself, when you're growing spiritually, what ends up happening is suddenly you have a surplus of energy in your system. You're no longer putting out fires. You're no longer just trying to get by. You're no longer really degenerating. You're actually having this surplus of energy that can go to awakening your third eye, that can go to creating certain harmonies in your body that you were unable to before. And people talk about, um, Edgar Casey talks about, um, you know, Atlantis and how there were crystals that were connected to the sun and there were rejuvenation temples and um, we could rejuvenate and heal ourselves. And I think this is getting into more of this solar energy and sort of stepping down and digesting solar energy and relating to that and, um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of little little secrets in that in, in that conversation. So also what happens is people start to wake up. All right. So part three of this discussion, we're going to be talking about the waking up. We're going to be talking about the sun in um, some of the weird conversations about the sun that happen in the mainstream. Um, things like with climate change and global warming and the attitude towards the sun. But people start to wake up. When the sun, when they have a certain spectrum of sun or their, or, or their prana really starts to circulate, they do start to wake up. And the reason being is because they're receiving that higher dimensional energy, which changes your perspective, right? We are very susceptible to lies and manipulation when we are full of pain, when we are full of trauma, and we're just ugh, so disconnected from our higher self. We don't know what our purpose is, and we're disconnected from that energy. We're very susceptible to being lied to. Because if we don't know who we are, if you don't know yourself or know thyself, trust me, you won't be able to discern anything around you. That's how perspective works. Okay? So when we begin to develop and we begin to have our prana moving through us and invigorating, okay? We start to wake up. We start to be like in the movie with the guy takes his glasses on and off and he's like, whoa, what is going on? We start to wake up. We start to maybe see this relationship isn't good for me. You know, um, my job isn't good for me. Or I've been hurting myself by doing this. Or I've been hurting people by doing this. I've been way too harsh. I've been way too soft. This sense of balance and harmony starts to form within us. Where we stop doing the extremes. And we stop... Um, sort of misconstruing ourselves, okay? Another thing that happens when we begin to align with the sun and have our energy running properly through us is as a, it will usually happen as a planet. You can do it individually, but there's also times where this happens collectively, and we are in one of those times. So you'll start to see a lot of weird shifts socially, um, socially, um, economically, politically, as soon as the sun starts to really gain momentum and start to um, emit different spectrums of light, we start to see the world change again because our world is an expression of the sun, right? Okay. Also, what tends to happen, though, is also innovation. People who have prepared themselves in other lives and in this life become innovative. They actually don't fear the sun and they don't necessarily see it as something that is bad. They actually become very innovative because their system is prepared to take in these higher dimensional rays, which makes them more creative. It brings your genius out. It's like the sun is like our collective soul in a way. So when we receive that, it, it begins to make us more creative. And we start getting more innovations and society can begin to move forward. So we often will see a split in society 
where some people will be very troubled and very, their darkness will become more and more obvious as though a light has turned on in a room and they're suddenly like, they're suddenly like this really gross looking, like there's this monster, there's these monstrous things in the world or there's these monstrous things in yourself because the light gets turned on and you didn't realize that it was that bad. This is what happens um, when we start to receive um, in more intense energy from the sun. And some of this will be visible and some of it, again, is not visible to us or not necessarily sensed by us. Because remember, a lot of this is a little bit out of our range of perception, but we are absorbing it nonetheless, okay? So, um, and um, this time can be very painful if we do not learn to connect with our higher self, attune to solar forces. It's be this can become very, very painful, okay? Um, it's kind of like 5D energy is starting to come down and push itself upon you. And like people that are sort of like very imbalanced, only thinking of themselves, very dark, have not done the work. It's extremely painful. It's extremely painful to suddenly have that force. It's like a giant mirror coming and it, it, you know, it's coming down on you, forcing you to look at you. It's extremely painful. People, I mean, if you talk to people about their kundalini awakening, they're not going to tell you that they were running through a field of tulips licking a lollipop. That's not what they will tell you about kundalini awakening. So when the sun starts to change, it, it starts to create mass kundalini spinning and energy within people. And if you start getting that light going into your trauma, ooh, it does not feel good. And so you'll start to see people more and more in society almost acting a little bit crazy or a little bit insane or losing themselves or having more extreme behavior because this is a purification as well, okay? But keep in mind, because we're gonna come back to this um, in part three, if someone has too much fear, if someone has neglected their development, the sun will augment that energy. Okay? And um, we've been discussing it from a spiritual perspective, but I had a really cool comment come in on my Facebook page, actually, with um, somebody talking about the sun and DNA. And so I will, I will start a forum thread and I will post, um, my resources on here. Um, and I'll post this website, but this was from an individual named Dan Iwaniki. And this person is someone who studies physics and he commented on my, on my Facebook page and his article pointed out that solar flares have been increasing for the last 20 or 30 years. And he poses the question and he supports it with various sort of scientific facts. What if increased solar activity causes photons emitted from the sun to carry information of a greater order? Or greater coherency and when they interact with our DNA via electromagnetism develop a greater coherency in our physiology thus expand our ability to perceive beyond the current paradigms what if the Sun and, and feel free to share you know chat about this in yourself in the comments or on, on the thread that I'm going to create. What if light is changing our DNA? And what kind of changes would it be? You know, these are things that we need to think of. Lastly, in this article, he brings up the idea of junk DNA and, and the idea that Perhaps we're missing the fact that we go through periods of time where the sun changes. It changes the quality of light that it emits. And this affects 
our DNA. It affects our structure and it begins to change us. And maybe there is this science that we're avoiding understanding. And maybe some people know exactly what's going on. Maybe some people understand the science and we're in the dark. And maybe it's time we remember. Because our energy depends on it. Our evolution, rather, depends on it. So this brings me back to something that we talk about a lot on this channel together, on my YouTube channel together and on this website together, which is large swaths of time or eras. We could say the Lemurian era, the Lemurian epoch, or we could say the Atlantean era, we could say our common era. We can sort of divide the human race into various times in which it exists. We call those eras, or in anthroposophy we call them epochs. And every epoch is not just time. It's also a specific formulation of light. And that specific formulation of light is an experience. They're codes, and they are lessons that we have that we are introduced to in the beginning of an epoch and then we reach a golden age and then near the end of the epoch we have an initiation did we understand the energy so light is the initiating body and every epoch has a series of initiations that humanity must learn must overcome certain patterns and, and, and styles of life and living and mysticism and ideas are introduced. We have to create and live within this theme, within this archetypal story of that epoch, go through certain challenges, certain inspirations, and then there's an, an, an initiation at the end where things kind of split and we move on to the next. This is the larger pattern of humanity. This is what the Mayans were tracking with their long count calendars. This is what the Druids knew. This is what our ancestors knew, but we have forgotten. And when we reach the end of an era or the end of an epoch, sometimes people will call it the Kali Yuga if you want the Eastern mysticism, right as we begin to start coming out of the Kali Yuga, which is where we are now. We're still in it, but we're actually rising out of it. Every day we're coming out of it more, right? What ends up happening is our sun begins to actually pull us out of the Kali Yuga through changing our DNA, through changing us. And you could say that, this, that the energy that the sun emits is you know, moving through the zodiac, and the zodiac is the, the, the sun's expressions or the sun's houses, where the sun emits energy from, is Aquarius. And so what will happen is Aquarius, the energy and the codes of Aquarius will start to push down upon us. What we know is Aquarius will start to push down upon us. And just that pushing down of that light upon us will cause us to reckon who we are. A new light is coming. Our sun is receiving new light from even higher suns. The whole, the whole cosmos is shifting and growing. This is what we do. This is what we do. We shift, we grow, we evolve. We go through light ages, we go through dark ages. There's so much spiritual language about that that describes that. But here we are, receiving, in many ways, a new sun or a different energy of sun and that sun energy or that light that's hitting us we call Aquarius we call the new era and it is a little bit higher than where we are now of course it'll be a dark age to Aquarius but we are going into that light element of it we are going into a upswing so we start receiving that now and that's actually the force that pulls us up so at the end of our eras we have an initiation did we learn 
what we came to learn in this occasion did we were we able to develop mind and not lose our spirit were we able to move through the dense heaviness of scientific materialism and come out the other side with some aspect of our spirit still nourishing us and still alive in us could we do that or did we make ourselves gods of this material plane and obsess over physicality and what did we do? What did we do as individuals? How did we pass this initiation? Where are we in this? Were we able to retain our spirit through an age of intense materialism? Were we able to link our mind to our spirit? Or did we begin to think that our mind and our ego, the lower aspect of our mind, is God and forget all about our higher consciousness, our higher mind? Here we stand in this initiation, and if you look at many of the issues that we face today, you can begin to you can begin to pinpoint it back to that spiritual perversion or that initiation that we all face today. So there are times when the sun changes. So there are times when humanity changes, when Gaia changes. And this is usually at the end of an era, going into a new one. And we actually ride the sun, we ride that initiating energy as a force that lets us know when we are going into a golden age and leaving it. Because also in a dark age, we have less of that energy hitting us. We have less of that solar fire hitting us. So we are less illuminated. So things start to build up. It gets darker and darker and darker and darker. And that's why when you look at the um, Christ, when you look at Jesus Christ, he came at such a dark time and he had to come as an individual person. He had to personify the energy as a person in the most densest possible way. And I'll get into that a little bit in part two here. But the, the energy of the sun had to become very, very 3D as a person for it to be meaningful to humanity because we sunk so low that we could not just connect with it, understanding that it's a spiritual force. It had to be personified for us to absorb that. So at the end of the dark ages, we move into sort of moving into a golden age and that is really, that is really determined by our star, our sun. Okay. And what will happen is our sun will begin to prepare humanity. So this will happen gradually, actually. So, you know, even a hundred years ago, it'll start to change. And then 50 years starts to go a little bit faster, a little bit more intense. The children coming in that are born of that little bit of a faster sun are now having to be initiated and come through that sphere. So they're going to be a little bit of a different consciousness, okay? And then as it gets going, it starts to speed up, get more intense, draw more things to it. It starts to be a little bit to us, would be a little bit more higher and chaotic. It doesn't just randomly do this. It is doing this as a function of consciousness, as, as co of cosmic consciousness. So our sun will initiate us into a higher phase. It will bring us out of the dark age should we be able to align with its coherence and face ourselves when it turns on the lights, okay? And there are always those that cannot pass the initiation. So in every era, there's always individuals who are able to pass the initiation at the end of an era to varying degrees but then there's also individuals that were unable to understand and they were unable to pass the initiation okay and so what ends up happening usually after a dark age is that there's usually a force that will arise and this happened in both Lemuria and Atlantis the end of an era, the sun starts changing, 
there is a force that will arise in mankind that are from the individuals that will not pass the initiation. They did not do the work. They're too heavy. They will attempt to block or change how humanity receives the sun. Okay? This happened in Lemuria. We talked about this in my lecture, The Magicians of Mu. I believe maybe at the two hour mark or so, um, we talked about how there were individuals that came that tried to basically create an incoherence or disconnection in the energy body and also in the eyes where it was so that the sun could not be picked up quickly or the sun could not be absorbed quickly and it slowed development down. There was things that were done to the energy body that, that did that. The same thing happened in Atlantis. There were alterations that were done that affected the human beings of Atlantis so they were not able to connect with the sun and perceive the sun properly because the sun was starting to function at a significantly higher rate. And if you listen to Edgar Cayce's teachings about Atlantis, which are the most comprehensive psychic um, investigations we have on the topic, you see that the crystals were tuned too high. Well, that was because the sun was changing and the crystals respond to the sun and it, and if humanity cannot match the energy of the sun for whatever reason it's just not coherent enough then things begin to fall apart and here we are um, in a sort of chaotic initiation phase so near the end of the era near the end of epochs usually you will have forces emerge that cannot handle the sun or that um, fear the sun that will try to stop humanity from perceiving it, okay? All right, so let me see if I have any questions that pertain to what um, I've said so far. And we're gonna start part two, spirits of the sun and beings of the sun. Okay, so okay, so let me see if there's anything here. Okay, regarding that Blavatsky quote about planetary bodies being an expression of the consciousness of the sun, do you think planetary moons having that relationship to their planets? Yes. So one of the most incredible things that we discover when we start to look at the solar system as a living, breathing consciousness is that every planet or even the idea of a planet is actually forming a function. You could see it as a function of the sun's consciousness, um, but it's also forming a function for humanity because humanity is an expression of the sun. So planets will form as an expression of the Godhead and human beings will incarnate onto planets and planets will basically hold a certain, I would say, theme. Usually it's... Usually the best way to describe it is some planets tend to be more masculine oriented and really explore the masculine aspect and some planets tend to be more feminine and we tend to go back and forth on feminine eras but even feminine spheres and masculine spheres to create a more balanced existence and we've gone through this from incarnations with Mars and Venus creating the planet that we are on now which went to create a mercurial realm which is connected with the sun, which we'll get in a little bit later now. So we can see that the planets are all working together to express a higher pattern so that we can live within a higher pattern and experience a higher pattern, okay? They're, they're allowing us to physically incarnate into a archetypal pattern that is within our sun. 
and that is with another, even higher systems. So moons will form as an expression of humanity's relationship with the sun, humanity's relationship with the earth. So what moons will form and kind of come out of the earth consciousness and they will hold what you could say is the unfinished energy of the planet. So a moon isn't just a moon like, oh, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this rock just floating by. Cool, what, what, what formed that? Oh, you know, energy, magnetism, and you know, science and stuff. Okay, sure, but these laws are also spiritual laws, and the moon actually will hold the last phase of evolution's karma. So we just came actually from a feminine era, a feminine epoch. We have moved into a more balanced era, but comparatively, we have more of that Logos masculine energy, which is a good thing because it was a little crazy. The matriarchies were a little crazy. Um, we want to be balanced, right? So the previous era was more of a matriarchy. We kind of call that the Lemurian era. And the moon arose at the end of that feminine era to contain and reflect to us our unmitigated, unhealed trauma from that era. And it will hold that until the end of another cycle in which we will all face our lunar self. We will all face our moon and we will either overcome the moon or we will not. The moon will either lock us into place or we will move beyond it. We will move beyond the lunar sphere. The moon is like a reflector. It reflects it basically reflects our energy back to us, our, our, our pain, okay? Um, not just our pain, but basically our undealt with stuff. That's really what the moon does. Kind of makes you look at moons a little bit differently, doesn't it? Um, so that's what I can say about that. I have a whole Isis rising thing that I want to get into this summer that describes exactly what planets are, exactly what the moon is, and and um, the, the, these energies. So the moons definitely have relationships to the planets. They are a function of the planets um, and they are a function of our own consciousness. An example of this is sometimes you'll see a moon goddess. You'll see a lunar goddess or a moon goddess. And this moon goddess will have a, a, a crescent on her forehead right here or she'll have a crescent on her feet. Okay, think of the high priestess in tarot. Think of um, the lunar images. What this is showing is a female who has overcome the moon. She has passed her moon initiation. She has passed the, she passed the, um, the feminine incarnation into a solar level of initiation. Okay, so the moon is an initiating body just like the sun, but it has to do with the feminine, what we would describe as the feminine epoch and a certain phase of consciousness. And now, you don't have to be a woman to relate to this. We all have had lives in female bodies and male bodies. It's not just about women. Um, it, it is, you, you, as a man, you will also have an aspect of yourself that will relate to the overcoming of the moon. Um, so this is a whole, that's a whole other thing. So I hope that answers your question. All right. So here is part two, spirits of the sun. Okay. So we just discussed solar energy, we discussed what it does to our system. We discussed what it does to the planet. We've discussed it, the different dimensions of it. We went really, really deeply into that. So let's start to personify this a little bit because the planets can personify and the sun can personify. So as mentioned in our introduction, the sun is a place, a location in a higher density and it also has beings or consciousness that dwell within the sun or the sun's sphere. 
These beings, these presences, are often considered great initiators and great teachers. And our ability as humans to teach and to initiate others into a higher energy or to introduce people to a higher energy is defined by our ability to connect with that sun sphere. How much of it can we contain? How, where are we in our solar initiations? Okay. And again, the sun represents 5D. It represents the pre-fall man. It represents the body immortal. It represents all these things. Okay. The more purely we can channel these forces, the better we are at psychic work, pursuits of creativity. The more innovative we are, the more transformational we are the closer to our true form we are, okay? And also maybe one of the most important symbologies of the sun when it comes to a being or an entity that can resonate at that level or that is from that sphere has achieved that level of initiation is that they have bypassed the lower astral forces. They have overcome the moon, okay? So a lot of the times, um, and this is, you know, I'm very critical of this um, within the spiritual community. People know that about me. I'm very hard on it because when we when we go out and we just become psychic, when we do psychic readings, who, well, what, what realm are you tapping into? Are you floating around in the lower astral um, in the false light or, or, or how, what, it, how much true light are you pulling into you? How much pure energy are you pulling into? Okay. So what is the most important thing is when you start being able to really resonate with the sun and hold that energy, you start to get very pure truth. You start to become a very pure channel. You start to become very powerful. And from your energy, you can initiate others and, tr and start to entrain them into that field as well. Without that solar force, you don't have that kind of magnetism. It all becomes an intellectual exercise. And we do see this a lot in spirituality, modern spirituality, where a lot of people will say, you know, uh, uh, very spir spiritual topics or spiritual things, metaphysical conversations, but they're not actually breaching into the spiritual realm. It is literally just intellectual discussions about what the spirit is or how the spirit works. There literally is no energy life force to be exchanged or initiated. It is an all and mental exercise. And that is one of our initiations here is to be able to understand when somebody has the power to initiate and when they do not. Okay, what that looks like. And we learn that through our interaction with true, genuine solar beings or people, beings who can actually contain a great deal of that energy. These are the great initiators. And they do act in certain ways, and they do have certain um, powers, okay? One of the coolest things that I, one of the coolest things that I found when um, putting this together for you guys was there were these beings in Egypt, and they were called um, neaters, or like knitters, not exactly sure how they would have said that back then. But in your book, you'll see that there's a picture of an Egyptian hieroglyph, and there's one, there's like a neater, they're called, carrying an ankh and like a little feather in their head. Now, these are basically sun gods, and the Egyptians are an example of a culture that revered sun beings, sun entities, sun consciousness, and sun gods. And we even see the idea of the personification of the sun take place in Egypt with Akhenaten. Before that, there was a more feminine belief about the world, which was many gods, many different expressions. And then when you start getting into Egypt and the solar energies, it pushes it into one unified force. And then when we get out of that, it goes into many, to one, to many. And it's back and forth that we, it's this back and forth process, sometimes the Eastern to the Western process where we learn who we truly are. But we can see this happening in, in, in Egypt where you start really understanding what a, a solar deity is. 
which is succinct. It is often the personification of the sun. It is a oneness. It is a more, um, I, I, I would say one compared to the idea of the many, I would say. Okay, so the Egyptians had these, the, the Egyptians um, believed that their soul actually came from the sun or through the sun, and they called that the Ba, and that was interlaced with the sun. So they didn't really see their soul as being different from the sun. They saw their soul as being part of the sun. And um, so that there was this solar force within us and that we could kind of carry, you know, varying degrees of this. Everybody could carry kind of varying degrees of this solar essence, carry, carry varying degrees of their own soul. And the Tibetans believed this as well. They called it a, um, I believe they called it like a solar angel or a solar force. They had the same belief as the Egyptians. But they also had gods that they gave sort of various names, but one was the Neaters. And these were gods that they, that they believe came from the sun. These were humans that could contain more of the sun. They had taken their energy body, as we had discussed earlier, and made it so it was so smoothly coherent that it could now emit the sun. And they call these solar deities or solar people um, and or sun gods. Okay. And also we know I can't I can't I can't go without mentioning we have a solar plexus chakra. And also in many languages, the word soul is S O or the, the, the word soul is pronounced soul, which means sun or S O L. So we still see this kind of lineage of solar worship or understanding the importance of being able to contain and mirror the sun in the ancients. We also see the incredible architecture and megalithic sites that directly tracked the sun became containers for the sun and people would do things where they would receive the sun in these megalithic sites. Okay. So another good one um, with Egypt, but that's also part of, um, it also appears in Edgar Cayce's work. It appears in to old, old, old Tibetan scriptures, Ra or Re. And that means sun. So Re means sun, R-A means sun, solar energy. And there were priests of the sun and the sun priests were considered very, very advanced. They were considered the initiators because again, the sun contains the most concise truth. The light that it has is the most concise truth. So it was extremely powerful. And in our Lemuria talk that we had, I actually read a small little quote about a priest of the sun or about Ray Ra. And in that presentation, Ra sort of rises above Lemuria as it's falling. And he said, did I not warn you? Did I not warn you what, you know, happens when we become indulgent or happens when we, when we become mean and cruel? So throughout our existence, throughout Lemuria, throughout Atlantis, throughout even where we are now, there are these forces of the sun. Ra, Re, Edgar Cayce calls it Rata. There are embodiments and forces of the sun, and they walk amongst us. And in higher ages or lighter ages, perhaps they recognize and you can know who they are. But as we sink into a dark age, they just walk amongst us. There are solar beings and people who have achieved a certain initiation to be able to contain certain levels of the sun. These are the great teachers. These are the great initiators. 
and teachers. We could also see them as Christed humans. One of the easiest ways to understand the stream of light from the sun is to recognize it as the Christ stream. Okay, so there are Christed humans and humans that have higher levels of ability to maintain the sun or 5D energy or Christ consciousness. Okay, the sun was also considered the father. So the sun was considered the father and it sort of would shine its beautiful rays on the earth, which was considered the mother. Earth is matter, matter, mother, mutter. And so the father would sort of activate, energize, and invigorate the mother, which is earth. So the, 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 the sky father or the, the son was considered the father. And this even went deeper and deeper in that the masculine consciousness is logos. It is a purified mind. It is structure. It is form. And so we have this imagery of the father, the son, pushing down the form of the cosmos, the correct codes of the cosmos, the correct forms, the correct archetypes for the time onto us. Clarifying, purifying, constantly pushing in the highest truth. And us aligning with it, we are moving with the mind of God. Okay? And this would not be a presentation about the sun unless we talked about Archangel Michael, who is the solar angel. And of course, Mike, Archangel Michael at this time is prophesied to slay Lucifer. So we have this really interesting image where at the end times, you have this solar force coming in, overpowering a dark force, overpowering an imbalanced force. And you could say that today you and I are in a spiritual battle and we are in a battle in the astral plane that's going on. Trust me, there is a battle going on in the realms around Earth where solar forces are claiming certain areas and then darker forces are also claiming certain areas. And that's called the battle in heaven. And it, we also see it here on Earth with various people that are possessed to varying degrees by these forces. Okay. All right. And also in, in most and many, many esoteric traditions, each human has a solar angel, which is actually their higher self or their Christed aspect. It's like the part of yourself where you kind of close your eyes and you tune into and you sort of start bouncing things off of or tuning things into, pinging things, and then you get that sense of clarity, you get that kind of sense of purity. You know, it's sometimes it's easy to connect with that energy and sometimes it's not depending on where we are. But that is the idea of that force. It's that Christ consciousness force that renders everything back into form. It's that logos, that spiritual logos, okay? And perhaps I think one of the greatest mysteries of the sun is the Venusians. And um, despite it being Venus, it is also associated with the sun and solar energy. And I think this is one of the biggest mysteries um, that is hard to talk about um, and hasn't really been talked about very much. But we're going to start to touch on it a little bit today. And also the Lords of the Flame. Okay, we're going to get into that. Okay. So, as I've mentioned, sun beings come to earth. They don't just hang out in the sun and lord over people or mitigate energy in the sun field. No, they incarnate. There are certain beings that are have achieved certain initiations that resonate with the sun. Their soul now resonates with a certain vibration of the sun, can contain it. And they will actually come to Earth. They will actually incarnate on Earth and they will be here. 
I think that one of the best examples of this that I think is probably the most popular that we can pull from is from Theosophy. And now Theosophy um, is a lot of, Theosophy brought forward a lot of ancient Eastern teachings. So even though this was brought forward, you know, at the turn of the century or before, what they were doing was they were modernizing ancient teachings um, and bringing them forward um, because that has to be done all the time. There always has to be teachers here bringing the information forward. That's how we move forward, right? So in theosophy, there's a, a very important teaching is found, which is that solar beings come during times of strife to help humanity evolve as they have achieved something and they have the, the light codes of awakening. So even Theosophy talks about these solar beings that will kind of come, especially during times of crisis, to, to help humanity along, okay? Now this is, this is spoken specifically 18 million years ago. So 18 million years ago during Lemuria, solar beings came through Venus, or you call them Venusians, Venusians that had achieved a certain level of initiation that resonated with the sun. And they came to Earth to initiate mankind because it was not evolving. Okay, it was not evolving properly. And that was the reason for theosophy. Is um, in, in theosophy, is they said that, that mankind wasn't evolving. But for me, looking back with my own abilities and what I've seen and what I remember, is that it's actually much deeper than that. When we get influxes of solar beings, these higher beings, there's actually times where spheres merge together. It wasn't just a selfless impulse alone that allowed these sort of, I guess you could call them solar Venusians to come to Earth to initiate humanity. There are certain times where planetary consciousnesses are drawn together and they overlap and there's an opportunity to do work together. And so it was very much a, it was very much an overlapping of spheres as I've described it in Isis Rising through my Venus videos. Um, as much as it was a personal um, ability to do so. So it was two things. It was definitely kind of highly initiated people that you could call Venusians. But there was also a kind of overlapping of the Earth with what we would call Venus and or Mercury gets a little confusing in this zone because what we what I'm actually referring to right now is Venus is actually Mercury because they were switched earlier um, due to the um, an advancing in consciousness and a um, change in the sky okay so these beings are sometimes associated with lords of the flame. So this is the fire energy. Um, a lot of the times when you think of Venusians, sometimes you will think of kind of this Promethean um, energy. Sometimes you might think of like Columbia, the Statue of Liberty with the flame. And so we have this imagery of these solar beings coming. They're always carrying a flame and they will come at certain times to help initiate humanity. And for them, um, they've reached a certain level of initiation within their own life where even them helping humanity is an initiation for themselves. So the soul goes through certain planetary spheres that represent certain initiations of humankind or of mankind. And when you got to a certain sphere, which we would see that as Mercury or Venus, 
um, when you, you achieve that solar initiation into that sphere, you were able to come and begin to teach. And so you're initiating others, but you're also initiating yourself into an, yet an even higher sphere of consciousness. Okay. And a lot of the um, wording around this, as soon as we start to talk about Venusians and Lemuria 18 million years ago, there's a lot of talk about Sunat Kumara. Um, personally, for me, I have not been able to personally connect with that figure or that. Um, it may just be in a future for me, but as of right now, because I know you guys will ask, I'm not familiar with that wording or um, or, or that at this time. Um, they're also called the Lords of the Flame, Venusians, and they ended up being the people or the beings that arrived to basically introduce humanity to higher frequencies, higher ways of life to get them going. And this is, again, this is something that happens in cosmic order as we initiate each other. The spheres interact at different times, forming new spheres, and we kind of interact with each other. Um, okay. All right. Let's see if there's any questions about this, because I know this is a weird one. Okay, so far no questions. Okay, okay. Actually, we can do this one. When building the 5D light body, do we reference the first or second planet from the sun? Once our Venus body is activated, do we still reference our current solar logos? Okay, so um, basically... Our energy body is an exact mirror of our descension process. So we ascend through the forms in which we descended. So when we form um, our Venus body, our mercurial Venus body, um, it is through a type of solar initiation, it is through the initiation of the sun. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's like retracing our footsteps, if you will. So it's like you're reactivating or you're, the body almost already exists. You're just filling it with light and, and restoring it, if you will. Um, that's one way to look at it because time doesn't exist. And a lot of when we start getting into this conversation, we actually have to remove time. Um, for it to make sense. Okay. So I want to go over this one more time to make sure that I'm understanding your question. When building the 5D light body, do we reference the first or second planet from the sun? Well, in order to build the light, your light body, you don't have to do any calculations at all. We are, we have such intelligence within our being that you don't have to try to do equations with, you know, the sun and say, oh my gosh, do I have to put the, th the, the sun in my third eye or do I put it in my solar plexus or do I put it here or here or what do I do with Mars? Where's Venus? Like, you don't have to do that. Our life force energy is so intelligent. And as I mentioned, it is a logos. It is a structure that all you have to do is actually just focus on very simple things, things like breathing properly, okay? Taking care of yourself, exercising, practicing forgiveness, practicing, um, you know, very basic spiritual development things will actually build you out your higher body. It'll build out your ascension body. It's through basically how you hold your energy each day. There's, there's no, you don't even have, and as you do it, you will become aware of where your energy is funneling from different planets, okay? All right. So, we had solar beings come to the Earth. Um, one of the most talked about times is in Lemuria, which was 18 million years ago, according to Blavatsky and according to her records. 
Um, and these solar beings, they're solar beings because they've achieved a solar initiation. They've achieved the initiation of a certain kind of union. But they did it on a, they didn't do it on the sun. They were on a different sphere, or, or I guess you could say a different sphere or, you know, earth consciousness in a different time. And they had a, they achieved something. So the sun initiated them. So they're technically a solar being. They're solar initiated. But they were on a, on a higher sphere when it happened. So the sun is the initiating body for all the spheres, right? So, all right. Earth needs to be initiated by higher beings with certain codes of awakening. It's how we evolve, and it's how higher beings evolve through service. So this is part of how human consciousness evolves. If this powerful energy is not received, it leads to devolution and regression. So one of the reasons why solar lords or these higher beings that have achieved a solar, a solar initiation on their sphere, why they end up coming here is because, again, sometimes it is very difficult for humanity to just like tune into the sun and, and it, it, you know, and kind of abstractly absorb all of the information that it needs. At this density, we need teachers to come and basically teach us human to human and initiate us into higher light. We need that type of connection because of how dense we are and how our mind has changed and how it has not really been able to connect with spiritual power directly. We lost our memory, basically. We lost our gifts, and so we need to have teachers come that are like us, but that are a bit more advanced and initiate us back into our higher self. And so that's really what goes on. And if these teachings are not picked up, if you're not able to align with the sun, what happens is that part of humanity will regress or it will devolve. So there's usually a period of devolution and evolution. I've talked about this lots on in, in the work here. We had it through Atlantis. We had it through Lemuria. There were Lemurians who evolved. There were some who devolved. There were Atlanteans who evolved. There were some who devolved. You know, it's not a clean. The end, the end times are not a clean thing, unfortunately. That's why they're often called Judgment Day or the Hopi calls it the two paths, things like that. And um, one of the most, I think, controversial things to this day and the misunderstood things to this day is the, um, the merging of solar initiated Venusians um, with certain humans to create a lineage, a certain lineage on the earth. I go into this on my video that's called Breakaway Civilizations or the two breakaway societies. Um, I go into that a little bit deeper, but these are basically human lineages that are, I would say, linked to solar beings and solar deities, um, and they can contain Christ consciousness. Um, they tend to be associated with the Christ stream. And um, beings tend to, beings that are associated with higher spheres tend to be born. And this is where it gets kind of crazy with people talking about different bloodlines and, and protecting different bloodlines and things like this. A lot of this has to do with solar initiators coming to the planet and um, helping it move along. And there needs to be a... Um, there needs to be bloodlines here that um, can contain that energy. There needs to be people here that are um, connected to that force. Um, and there is, a, a, there is also, as we know, the inner earth um, is part of this. And um, these beings come in many different ways. 
they can come by materializing themselves from other realms or levels of the earth, chambers of the earth, if you will. But there's also, again, there's certain individuals that carry, I would say, a certain blood or a certain, their physicality is closer to that form. And so we have that, and that causes a lot of confusion in the world. And, um, and it's a conversation that is actually going to be coming up more and more and more and more because we have to talk about it because what ends up happening is what ends up happening is people start to retrace this pattern okay we start to come around and we start to get into more in you know certain incarnations coming back around we start to get you know even children being born that are more advanced than the last um, we start getting mutations. We start getting ourselves as individuals moving closer and closer to Christ consciousness. So we do have to start talking about all the different facets about how Christ consciousness works on the planet, how it and how it's interacted with us over the time. We have to start talking about all of this very openly and exploring it, um, because if we don't, then it's very easy to misunderstand um, the idea of interdimensional that come from this sphere and their patterns of incarnation and um, the details around their existence okay all right it was really interesting um, I really in, I really enjoyed reading this and um, there was this, <laughs> some of the things are so silly though w one of the things that happened in the Lemurian age was that some individuals that sort of refused these solar forces ended up becoming like deformed and they ended up turning into like, I think Blavatsky described it as like red, hairy beings. Um, and they just ended up sort of becoming like a whole different thing. And so it was really interesting to read about these sort of mutations that also happened by people who, like, did not accept change. It actually mutated their form, or it, it made them, it actually mutated their form, or it made them seek to mutate themselves. And this sort of reminded me of the transhumanism movement, where here we are at this time of solar changing, and we are literally talking about mutilating ourselves again and transforming ourselves into something else. So we're repeating the same pattern. The same thing happened in Atlantis with the automatons and also other kind of strange things. So we are literally just repeating the same patterns in different times, okay? All right. All right. Okay. So because it is Easter, I thought we could just go a little bit deeper into Jesus and Jesus as a, a, a man. Um, some people, because Christ's story and his mythos is so connected to the sun and the idea of solar cults, people will take the position that he is just an idea. He's a myth that we've created because, you know, we wanted to understand the sun or our primitive ancestors worship the sun. So we just kind of made a modern sun worshiping person. And this is not in my research and in my understanding and in my memory and, you know, within the bones of my being, I don't see that as, as, as being reasonable for me. When I look into this, I see that there are times on the planet when you will get an initiator or a spiritual teacher um, who will actually physically embody the sun. So again, in temple cultures, the tradition was resurrection. The tradition was to survive, 
death. This meant that you had achieved your initiation in the 3D world and you were now a 5D functioning individual. Even monks, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the Himalayas, they practice doing incredible things with their bodies. So this, this was all part of, of ancient, you know, mystery tradition. And there were certain um, traditions that were held very closely about this. And there was a very strong connection kept with the sun. And over time, there were lots of different temple cultures or lots of different mystery schools that happened. And they all kind of were breaking away from each other and forming these different things. They kind of kept the same tenets. But there was one school that kept it very closely and they kept in close contact with the sun and they kept in close contact and they lived in a certain pure way and they knew that the sun was going to be incarnating. They knew that there was an essence in the sun that was going to basically incarnate into a physical being. And a lot of people didn't keep that connection they didn't believe that and they didn't think it was possible and um that was because we had sunk so 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 far into materialism that we we, we, we like couldn't imagine that it that, that it could happen and so there was a lot of um controversy about whether this occurred and about whether he was real and whether you could transcend death because a lot of the temple cultures just couldn't do it anymore. If I, if I want to speak plainly, a lot of them just really couldn't uh, carry out that tradition anymore. Hadn't been done for a very long time. And so the way that we can understand this, one of the best ways to understand this is that Humanity has a very difficult time just understanding the sun because we are not a sun. I'm a physical person. I have a brain. I have a whole body. You know, I'm a physical person. I'm not a sun. There may be an aspect of my consciousness in the 10,000th 10, 10, dimension where I'm a sun and shining on people. And, and that's amazing. That's very abstract. But from the consciousness that I am peering out of now, I am human. I understand humanity. I understand human things because I am human. And I'm part of a human collective consciousness that I'm constantly feeding into and pulling from and living within that I incarnated in. And so what ends up happening is if all of the codes of initiation just stay in the sun and beam down on us, it's often too abstract for us to fully understand. So what ends up happening is a great initiate will come to earth and they will carry the sun within them for that time and they will teach whatever energy is within the sun. So what that looks like is you will basically become an alchemical individual. So you will take on the sins of humankind. What does that mean? What does it mean to take on the sins of mankind, the pain of mankind, the trouble of mankind? It means as an energetic force, you go into the collective consciousness and with your mind, you become it. You have to be a 5D force to even be able to perceive that much. You come in, you absorb all those vibrational frequencies of pain within humankind, all of the problems humanity is dealing with at that time. You take it and you begin as an individual energy doing all of the alchemical equations to solve them. And then you become the answer. And when you do that, because you've incarnated directly into the collective consciousness, taken on all of the pain and the issues of the time, you then have the codes of awakening for 3D, for this dimension, for this density. So we are human, so we need to often be taught by a human and a very, very, very advanced human so that we understand. And when that happens, a beautiful thing happens is when that happens, when he comes into this plane, absorbs all of the karma onto himself, it's not that he solved it. It's not that he personally solved all of your problems for you. 
It's that he took on a certain energy and then offered etheric pathways through the lower astral. He, uh, he took it on through and, and solved them through his own alchemical solar work. And when that happens, when you solve anything within yourself, you offer an etheric pathway to the collective to solve it as well. So what it means when you take on the sins of someone else or the sins of mankind, it means you take on the problems of that era. You do the equations through your spiritual work. You do the alchemy. You get the codes of awakening. And because you're in 3D and not 5D looking down, you're in 3D, you're in the world, you're in a body, you're in the consciousness, you're in the problems, you can then <laughs> contribute them to the collective, and you have a ladder here. There's something that we can follow. And this is what great initiators and great teachers do. They contribute codes to humanity, alchemical codes that allow us to overcome something. They give us that fire, they give us that transformation. There's extremely and advanced ones like the Christ, but there's also other ones. And, and Christ has taken, the Christ consciousness has taken many forms. Buddha, there's many different evolutions of this, okay? But we get these great initiators that have the power of the sun, and they do this alchemy within themselves that automatically goes into the collective. And their life, because they are an embodiment of the sun, will often mirror the sun. And we're going to get into transfiguration a little bit later in this talk. But I hope that, I mean, it's a very brief conversation, but I hope that sort of metaphysically makes sense. But that's also why, you know, you look at astrotheology and you see that this individual's life mirrored the sun because he was containing the power of the sun and we're incarnating into a logos. So there are certain times when these individuals are going to come. And the Magi's and people, they know when these incarnations are going to happen. And when they do happen, they have certain things that go on in their lives and various things. And um, a lot of that has to do with astrology. Um, but he moved as the sun and had certain things that happened to them when the sun was doing things like the transfiguration or the solstice, birth on the solstice, death on you know, close to the equinox. This is because he was functioning as the sun on earth. I hope this makes sense. He could do the alchemy because he was both 3D and 5D. He was able to build the bridge because he was both of those things, which is very rare. All right. Okay, so we're going to get into, thanks for hanging out with me for so long today. I'm going to get into, um, I'm going to get into part three, which is those who fear the sun. Before I do that, I'm going to see if there is a question that has to do with um, what I've talked about. Okay. There is the theory the sun has died. One can combine the theory with the 2012 theory, maybe that the sun has died and that the sunlight therefore has changed from yellow to white. Thoughts on this? I've heard this quite a bit. Um, the sun has definitely changed and I'm not sure how, I, I, I'm not sure if we can say that the sun has died because the light has changed. I actually haven't looked into whether or not our sun has died, and it's one of those things where our sun will disappear in like 10 million years because it takes so long for the, I have no, I'm not exactly sure. I've heard that the sun is fake, and I've heard that the sun has died. What I can say is that the sun is changing, which is why it went from like a traditional yellow golden color to white. It's going into a higher frequency. So I'm not sure that I can comment on it on it having died or being gone, but I can say that it is changing, okay? 
Okay, this one. Does the sun reflect the flow of knowledge similar to the flow of energy to create life and food? My guides show the sun to me as eyes that read the words of knowledge. Does that make sense? Oh, I love that. Let me read that again. My guide, my guides show me this, the, the sun to me as eyes that read the words of knowledge. It makes complete sense to me because, you know, we have the sun, which is really spiritually emitting to us the logos, the mind of God. So it is basically like you're reading a book. Like when you tune in, you're basically just being imbued with information, right? So it makes sense to me that you would be metaphorically told that um, you're sort of reading the words of knowledge. I like that. Does the sun reflect the flow of knowledge similar to the flow of energy to create life and food? Yeah, it is the flow. It is. It does really symbolize the flow of energy. It's life. It is the invigorating force. And it does symbolize the flow because it's always emitting the next step. It's always emitting the next stage or the current stage. And we're always having to align with it. And it's not like we're like behind, like, oh no, we're behind. But what, en what, what ends up happening is we get behind with our own consciousness because we are the sun. There's an aspect of our soul that is the sun, the highest part of our soul that is the sun. And so we do want to move along with it because that in turn means that we're moving in line with ourselves, okay? All right, now, part three of this presentation is a little bit different. We're going to go off the rails a little bit, which I really like to do. And I really like conspiracy. I like questioning everything. I like to be on the, 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 the objective side of everything if I can because I find that that's a very pure place to be, at least for me. And so we're gonna dive into this and it's gonna cover a couple conspiratorial topics. But as you guys know, I don't shy away from that. So now that we understand the sun and its power, and meaning. What happens when we try to obscure the sun or block the sun? How would we do that? What are the different ways that we could try to obscure the sun or block the sun? What does that mean? And what happens when we are exposed to a changing sun or a sun that's becoming more powerful and we're not prepared. So now we're kind of getting into the shadow side of all of this. We just talked about sun beings and Christ consciousness and now we're talking about what happens when that very high vibrational force hits people that aren't ready or people that have denied it people that have divorced themselves from their own spirit. So this really, this whole thing, this whole presentation and everything that I'm doing here today started from one vision that I had. And I was actually doing a health reading for someone. And this person was having sort of something that's been very common lately, which is a lot of people are having almost like autoimmune issues or they're, they're going through this process where they're having health issues that they've struggled with like their whole life, but that maybe seem to be toned down a bit, just pop back up in their life. You know, like you have this arthritis condition for a while and then it kind of seemed like it was doing better and then it just comes back with all these other things that you thought you overcame. 
And so when I was tuning in, I fully expected to receive information that this person um, maybe was eating something they were allergic to, or there was some kind of thing in their life that was causing stress. And so I was really shocked with what I saw. And here is what I saw. I saw light come in and spirit said, the sun is changing. It's emitting a more coherent and powerful charge. And it's causing people to experience strange symptoms. It's causing people to experience strange psychological conditions as they're cycling through emotions very quickly. It's causing people to experience depression, anxiety, because again, their etheric body and their energy body is suddenly being purified. And again, this is not about how much sun you receive on your skin. This is something that's happening through your etheric body. Okay, this is this this is a solar force that's beyond physicality that's hitting you, right? And a lot of these were also kind of autoimmune-like symptoms, strange symptoms, weird symptoms, old illnesses coming up. And I saw a bunch of people experiencing this, and 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 and, and also just mental issues like you know all sorts of things not being able to sleep depression just pressure weird almost feeling like you're in like a room and it's like echoing just really weird physical things going on and i thought oh i really didn't expect for spirit to come through and say this is a collective issue that we're all going through and it has to do with our body receiving light, spiritual light at an increased rate. Then I saw a spinal cord and I saw the solar energy kind of moving up the spine and trying to move up and down the spine. And that the spine was sort of like this antenna for the sun. And it was like receiving the sun and we were all, we're all here and we have various struggles and we're, we're carrying like backpacks of pain and like various different places and like we're not dealing with stuff or whatever we're just you know we're, we just came out of a dark age so we're, we're you know there's a level of us that's pretty unaware and distracted from what's really going on in our inner world so the sun and this and this power and, and chi is coming up our spine and it's like pew pew it's like it's interacting with our pain and it's pushing it in our system so it's causing all of these weird symptoms that don't really make sense because they're just your relationship with your own light body awakening. So it's creating this purification and this pressure to heal. And then I saw a bunch of people that were becoming really concerned that they had a virus or that they had COVID because of this because they just couldn't understand what was going on and there was so much talk about a pandemic and a virus that people were actually thinking that these things experience the these symptoms that they were having was from a virus was from covid and i also saw that people's bodies may go through a phase of rejecting energy and sort of weird these weird energetic changing and rendering energy coming up into the spine and then it kind of goes to various subtle bodies and even causing weird dreams like all of this kind of strange stuff going on so i saw these physical symptoms and then my vision changed and i saw a lion and i saw the star sirius and i saw the sun entering the lion and then I saw the star Sirius lining up with our sun in the lion. And so obviously, if you understand cosmology, this is the Lion's Gate portal. And this is also what we know as Christ's transfiguration. It's a time where the sun lines up with its higher sun. Because remember what we just talked about. Remember what we talked about in the beginning of this presentation. The sun is part of a trinity of suns. It's part of a chain of suns. So when our sun aligns with Sirius, 
which is its higher dimensional, which is a higher dimensional variant of our sun. Its light is changed. Its light is intensified, magnetized. And so Christ returns during the time of the lion. The sun changes during the time of the lion into a more pure form of itself, a higher form of itself. It's magnetized and is something even greater than what it is. And so I saw the time of Leo this year being a very sobering time. And when the sun and Sirius align this year, there's going to be a more intense energy. And um, I do know that in the past, there's been an unusual amount of weird things happening, usually on the Lion's Gate. Like, for example, in World War II, the atomic bomb was dropped um, on Lion's Gate. The atomic bomb was dropped basically on Christ's transfiguration. And so you wonder when you hear things like that, you know, was that ritualistic? Anytime anything happens on a ritualistic date, I question, you know, is there something sacrificial about that? You know? And so we're going to start getting a lot of very powerful rays from Aquarius around the time of this lion's gate. And it's going to very powerfully begin to affect people. Okay, so I saw a big leap of energy around the time of Leo. And um, that the specific power of that light because our sun has also been built up to a certain point to this point. And then when it combines with its higher sun, um, it's side of the sun is almost transfigured in its own way. And that is what is sort of also meant with returning as a lion. It returns in through, through the lion's gate, a more powerful version of itself, okay? And the sun, the earth couldn't handle this you know, 2,000 years ago. It's it's definitely an initiation, a, a big initiation into Aquarius. And then, so it kind of acts like a power-up or an evolution, okay? And then I was totally floored um, by the next aspect of my vision. I saw COVID-19, and I saw the pandemic and I saw um, the whole the whole pandemic narrative that is hanging in society like a cloud that we're all kind of interacting with and trying to navigate. I saw it and I saw vaccines and I saw that the that the COVID nineteen narrative or the people that are behind the COVID nineteen narrative will soon be merging these two narratives with climate change and global warming. And these two things are going to be at least very much behind the scenes linked. But I saw something disturbing and I, I sat with this for a while um, and I, I didn't know whether I wanted to say anything or, or, or how to say something. Um, and then I decided just say it like you saw it just read the information as it is and people can do with it what they will. That's all any intuitive can do. And it is everyone's job to navigate their psychic, their world themselves. So um, what I saw was that the, the vaccines and some of the treatments for COVID-19 will make people sensitive to the sun or make it so that people can't receive the sun. And I heard the word sun sickness. So it's like vaccines or the, a treatment for COVID-19 um, will cause such changes in the human body that it will, that it will, not be able to receive the sun or through that whole narrative people will be told that the sun is toxic that 
these react that, that whatever's going on in people, they could be reactions from the treatments or reactions from COVID-19 vaccines. They're told that it is because the sun is becoming toxic and the sun is becoming dangerous and that the sun must be stopped. And all of these rashes or problems that people are having is actually from the sun and it's not. And so I saw that as a potential timeline or a potential plan. And I specifically saw it in regards to a vaccine and that there would be many, 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 many different vaccinations. And the goal was to have many, 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 many vaccinations. And that this would eventually change the human form over time to do various different things. But one of the things was affecting its ability to receive the sun. And just using this whole time of awakening and the whole COVID-19 thing to, to link it to demonizing the sun, to link it to global warming, it was all interlaced, it was all interconnected. And um, I, I actually cried when I, when I saw it because for me, it was, it was such a perversion to try to stop people from receiving their Christ consciousness. Like it was like, it was so, I mean, people didn't understand, they didn't realize what it was. They didn't know what was going on. And, I, and that honestly broke my heart. And so, there was this link between everything that's going on with COVID-19 to global warming and climate change and, and, and wanting to do weird things to block out the sun. And if they can't block out the sun to change human beings so that they can't receive solar energy somehow. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, I don't, I don't have those answers. I only have what I saw. So, yeah, I'm sure that there are some individuals maybe in this group or around that could really go into the potential of that a lot more than me. But in the background of all of this, in the background of, like, of everything, we do have this climate change global warming narrative that has been nipping at our heels the whole time. And what is happening is that Gaia is genuinely not doing well. We have an incredible acidification of our oceans. You could argue that that's actually one of the biggest issues that we have. We've got killer whales popping up in the Gulf of Mexico. We've got all sorts of weird things going on. We've got plastics. I mean, we have so many issues that we need to heal and that we need to live more symbiotic with our earth. There's no question about that. But what I see sometimes is people think that political leaders or certain super wealthy philanthropists, or it doesn't even matter how much money you have, but certain philanthropists that have a lot of power are, 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 are rooting for us. And we have a real problem with humanity not understanding that we can be manipulated and that individuals can take genuine issues and invert them so that they can take advantage of mankind and lead mankind down a path that it does not want to go. That is beneath them. And I see this happening with climate change. I see this happening with global warming. It's turning into a weird way to control people. 
and it has very little to do with actual issues that are going on. The first thing we need to talk about is how to live more symbiotically with our planet, which is a spiritual existence. Okay, we can't legislate these things. There's a much deeper change that's needed, and it's not going to come through the, you know, the, the, the climate change narratives that we're seeing. So this is another talk. I'm just bringing this up because I see this becoming a very big thing. I think we're going to start getting, as soon as things with COVID-19 start to get to a certain point, we're going to start seeing a lot of really crazy weather. And we're going to start seeing the climate change narrative pick up. We're going to start seeing things like the World Economic Forum that says things like, oh, you don't need to own anything. I'm going to own everything and you'll be happy. You don't need to own any possessions. You don't need to own any house, anything. Nothing is yours. It'll all belong to us and you'll be happy. And this is green. It's green because I'm controlling it. It's green because a government entity is controlling it. That it, It's crazy. So we have to be very, very aware of these various narratives that are coming up and disguised in compassion. They rob us blind. Be very, very wary of those individuals that are claiming to be the most compassionate, caring environmentalists or people, and they use that cloud to rob us blind or to change the world in a way that we don't want. We have to be very, very discerning at this time. So why I'm sharing this is because I don't want to, I don't want humanity to turn against the solar force because it means that they would turn against their own solar force. You look at things like, you know, Bill Gates wanting to pop some giant balloon to block the sun and, and chemtrails and various other projects that are all about, you know, weird things. We have to look very closely at this. Luckily, I believe Sweden or Switzerland um, said no to Bill Gates' plan to block the sun. And by the way, we were ridiculed as conspiracy theorists about this. We were talking about this like a while ago. Everybody said, you know, you're crazy. There's no, there's no plans to block the sun. Yet here we are again where a conspiracy theory is proven true. When will we learn? When will, when will we learn that it doesn't matter whether information is called a conspiracy theory or truth or whatever, just look at the information and analyze it for whether it's true or not. When will we become, when will we grow up enough to do that as a society rather than try to label everyone and dismiss everyone all the time because they believe something different? How much will it cost us our relationships with ourselves on this planet and also our relationship with the cosmic bodies. How much do we have to lose before we grow up? So we have to be very careful about how we are genuinely caring for the earth, who we're supporting, and also um, how the solar force is treated because we just talked about how important the solar force is to all of us, that it is us, basically. And... I had um, a wonderful comment again on my Facebook. I do read my comments and I, I love you guys so much and I love the, the links that you guys send me. They're so enriching and I learn so much from you guys and I really wanted to take a moment and, um, uh, and, and, and read a Rudolf Steiner quote. I know we are too, I know we're running long as usual, but I wanted to read this Rudolf Steiner quote because he made a quote before any of this was even in his mind or in the collective mind about how vaccination, how inoculations could change humanity. Obviously, there's a good side of vaccines that is helpful and nourishing, right? But that nourishing power, that helpful power can also be used to hurt. Now we have to understand this. There is a good side to inoculations and power and medicine, but there's also an evil side. And we have to know that. It's not, it's not simple, right? 
And so he goes into this negative potential. And maybe we could even say about stopping the solar forces from entering us. If we know that the spiritual fire is connected to the sun, and that's our spirit, and we receive our initiations from the sun and from light, then we can understand what Steiner is saying here. And I'm going to read this now. I have told you that the spirits of darkness are going to inspire their human hosts in whom they have been dwelling to find a vaccine that will drive all incl inclination towards spirituality out of people's souls when they are still very young. And this will happen in a roundabout way through the living body. Today, bodies are vaccinated against one thing or another. In the future, children will be vaccinated with a substance which will certainly be possible to produce, and this will make them immune so that they do not develop foolish inclinations connected with spiritual life. Foolish, here of course, in the eyes of the materialists. A way will finally be found to vaccinate bodies so that these bodies will not allow the inclination towards spiritual ideas to develop. And all their lives, people will, be, will believe only in the physical world they perceive with the senses. Out of impulses which the medical profession gained from presumption, oh, I beg your pardon, from the consumption tuberculosis they themselves suffered, People are now vaccinated against consumption, and in the same way, they will, be, they will be vaccinated against any inclination towards spirituality. This is merely to give you a particularly striking example of many things which will come in the near and more distant future in this field. He's talking about the field of medicine changing to actually deform, become deformed and start creating things that, that view spirituality as a detriment, as foolish, as stupid. Okay. The aim being to bring confusion to the impulses which want to stream down to the earth. After the victory of the Michaelic spirits of light. The impulses which want to stream down to the earth after the victory of the solar angel or spirits of light. So what he's saying here is that there will be a battle and there will be the sun beings, the sun energy, the sun essence will come and kind of during this battle or after, there will be certain medical things done to human beings to stop that light from getting in, to challenge that process. He says it right here. To bring confusion into the impulses which want to stream down to earth. So this was prophesized. And um, I just found that quote to be very interesting because it's almost like I saw that in a different way. It's really, it's really crazy. Okay, so. Okay. I think there will be a desire to get a lot of people vaccinated before or around the date of the lion. And... The other thing that I saw with this that was really interesting was... I also saw that there are certain advanced technologies that elite groups have, but that these technologies only function within a lower spectrum of energy. So they can't really go beyond the fourth dimension. They can't really go beyond that. They're really trapped within 4D and 3D. And all of their sort of stuff that they have is kind of within that more lower vibrational realm. And I saw that when the sun starts to come, in greater forces, you know, and the spirit of Archangel Michael, the solar angel, and the all that stuff starts coming in, it's going to render a lot of their technologies either unpredictable or over time not be able to be used at all. 
So there's actually a real crisis in power amongst some of these elite groups that have these elite technologies that when the sun changes, they will not be able to use their technologies in the same way because the light is different and it's pulling the machinery and it's pulling all of it in a different way. A lot of the advanced technologies directly have to do with light, directly have to do with sunlight and the rhythm of the sun. And there are certain technologies that are very, very, very old um, that are kind of reworked and, and not really very powerful that are very complicated compared to the higher ones. And those are actually going to stop working. That's a big problem. And that brings us to Mars. That brings us to Mars. After I saw people having these reactions and it being blamed on the sun and calling the sun toxic and like demonizing the sun and all of that. I remembered this video that I did three years ago. It's still up on YouTube. You guys can watch it if you want. And it was about Mars and I was doing a reading for somebody and they had a health condition. And I asked to see what the root of the health condition was. And it was a skin condition. So this person had a very bad rash, especially when they went out into the sun. And he'd seen all these different people. He had sort of some immune issues as well. And like nobody really could figure it out. So I guess his thing was that he had to go to a psychic, you know, like that's what a lot, a lot, a lot of ha happens sometimes. You go to a mystic when everything else fails. And so I was, again, I was expecting to see, okay, this person has a diet problem. Like there's something that they're obviously allergic to. I was full on ready to like get some kind of diet information. I didn't. I was brought to Mars. Immediately in my mind's eye, I was brought to Mars. And I saw this individual, I saw him on Mars. And he was in the sand and it was blowing over him. It was windy. And there was a yellow powder everywhere, kind of like on his body and like around. And I remember the the air smelled like chemicals. It smelled like like chlorine or like like bleach like it smelled toxic almost kind of like a urine smell but not quite do you know what i mean this is very <laughs> i'm making it weird and very detailed but it doesn't have to be but so i was there and i and, and he's laying there and i see that i realize he's on mars and he's not even on earth. And there's these two tubes that are coming up like this. And he's got all of these like, like uh, transhumanist parts all over his body. And his skin is covered in these open sores all over him. It was basically like someone had been hooked up to the Borg fallen down and there were all of these like blisters basically and then spirit stepped in and they said this is from the sun they moved too far away from the sun on mars they tried to play god they went down the transhumanist path of trying to play God and mirror psychic abilities with machines rather than just go on the organic evolution path as we've talked about many times here. And the sun began to get into its more intense phases and nobody really survived because the sun had a reaction with the technology in their bodies. So they died out because they were still relating, they're still part of the sun. They ended up basically kind of like frying themselves. And they called the sun Un. That was something like O-O-N, like Un at the time. I remember 
hearing the language. I could hear the language. I could hear them talking. Um, I could hear them worried. I, I saw they were so intelligent and they were so smart and they had a lot of wisdom, but they played God too much. And they didn't survive because they lost their organic form. And when they lost their organic form, they lost their ability to evolve with the sun. They began to move into a divergent timeline. And that reading bothered me for a long time because I didn't know what to, that's all they told me. What do I, you know, you're having these health issues and I wanna give you a plan of attack. I wanna give you grounded practical advice on how you can heal if I possibly can, or at least give you someone else to talk to, whatever. But I just got this cosmic vision. And then Spirit told me that that's not how this works. I don't get to decide the kind of information that comes in. I just have to relay it. And I guess that when you remember cosmic lives, you awaken a circuitry within you. And so he had, by me sharing that memory with him, it was opening himself to heal because he finally understood where it was rooted in. And he really was somebody that resisted it. And I think he was a lot more spiritual. So there was a lot, there was a, a bigger impulse impact on him when it happened and he died on Mars. And so I say this because are we repeating a pattern? Right along with all of this stuff, we're also hearing a lot of stuff about Mars. Suddenly, you know, over the last three to five years, it's all about Mars. We haven't sent a rocket to a planet. We haven't cared. We hadn't gone to the moon for like 60 years. We had done very little with space. Now suddenly it's Space Force, it's Mars, it's colonizing Mars. You can be an indentured servant on Mars. Suddenly a lot of people want to get off planet. Suddenly a lot of people want to get off planet. And the guy who is pushing everybody to get off planet or the genius that's getting everybody off planet is Elon Musk. And Elon Musk is also spearheading transhumanism. He's also spearheading Neuralink. Are we repeating a cycle? And sometimes when I look around and I see how things are being done and there's all this talk about wanting to harvest humanity, dark forces want to harvest humanity, battle between good and evil and all this kind of stuff that we find in every single myth and in spirituality. And I think, May, what if, what if we have to also start thinking about Mars? And what if a lot of this is a harvesting narrative for a civilization or certain people that want to go to Mars and repeat a certain cycle that's happened? And I know, I know that this is getting um, uh, very out there. But in a way, I don't think it is. I think we do repeat cycles, and I think that we do repeat patterns, and I think we need to start really questioning what is going on with Mars. Because there's a lot of power to influence from another planet, right? So, all right. And I'm going to do your questions now. We've gone for quite a while. Um, and I want to end on this quote from a book called Serpent Power, which is all about basically, um, the development of our chi and our energy body. And I thought that this was a really good quote to end on, you know, ending at the scene where we're on Mars, the transhumanism agenda has gone full swing and organic consciousness is the only thing that can survive with the sun and anything else ends up dying. So here's the quote. Man's failure to understand the laws of magnetic resistance or of solar repulsion comes, for instance, the menace of sunstroke. 
When the etheric body and its assimilative processes are comprehended scientifically, man will then be immune from dangers due to solar radiation. He will protect himself by the application of the laws governing magnetic repulsion and attraction, not so much by clothing and shelter. It's largely a question of polarization. And that is from the book Serpent Power by Arthur Avalon. So maybe I will leave you with this question, which is that maybe we're not here to play God. Maybe we're not here to block the sun, to chemtrail the sky into a different shape, to block it in other ways, maybe with satellites and different frequencies that can block certain rays of the sun. Lord knows what kind of things go on that can block our sun. Maybe we're not here to do that. Maybe we're not here to become hyper-controlling of our reality. Maybe we're here to align with the sun and use the sun's power as a way to understand our own polarization, our own level of polarization. We're meant to use it as a force to render ourselves whole again. It is a guidepost, not an enemy. And the further we move away from the sun, the further we move away from ourselves. And that is why so many great beings have emanated the power of the sun and have been called sun gods and sun beings till the beginning of our time. So thank you so much for being with me. I am now going to take your questions. All right. All right. As a kid, I used to look right into the sun when I was alone. It didn't bother me and it felt normal and relaxing. Now as, it, as an adult, I'm actually super sensitive to sunlight into my eyes. Is there a metaphysical explanation to this change? I'm super sensitive to the sun. I'm sort of a ginger, so I tend to burn very easily. Or you could say burn very easily or I get my vitamin D very quickly, as I like to call it. Um, and there are so many, um, there's so many interesting metaphysical conversations about this. Um, the lighter eyes tend to reflect light where, um, they're electric. Okay. So we had this conversation in one of my live Q and A's, maybe three live Q and A's ago. So there's electric and magnetic forces. And as Arthur Avalon has put it in the Serpent Power book that I just read a quote from, we have to understand our polarization, right? You have to understand what your particular polarization is or what your archetypes are, who you are. And then you relate that to the sun and the spirit and you, and you evolve. Um, so a a blue eyes or light eyes... Um, are usually more photosensitive and they tend to be electric and have electric qualities. Um, and darker eyes tend to be magnetic and they tend to represent earthy, um, the earthy sphere. One isn't, they're both beautiful. Um, uh, one isn't better than the other. They're just uh, re represent a different makeup that you have. So, um, yeah, also one of the interesting things also is it's like, it's, it's almost like maybe that eye is tuned for like a different type of sun or a different type of light. I don't know. There's so many different things that we can, um, go into, but there is a metaphysical explanation for everything about you. That's the most incredible thing about you. And it's one of the most amazing things about spirituality is certainly oneness, but also discovering your amazing individuality as well. Why are you? How your energy flows in you differently than other people, right? All right, what else have we got here? Uh, 
Okay, this is another question about sun and what if you live in a place that is very cloudy most of the time? What are some things we can do? My energy seems lower sometimes when the sun is not shining. Well, um, it can help to definitely be um, in the sun or around the sun, but the majority of our prana um, is received um, through our etheric body, which is not physically. So it actually doesn't matter where you live. Um, our life force energy is not determined by our physical level of absorption. It's actually a energetic exchange that's significantly deeper than what the physical world can even perceive. Um, so, but the sun being what it is, it has an incredible impact on us and um, if you are feeling low, the sun can help you. Um, and that's because of what it is. Um, and it is a lot harder to live in, I think, in many ways, unless you're used to it. I think darker, colder climates do tend to. How my spirit guides have always told me is that because I grew up, in Canada. I was actually born basically in the Arctic. Um, and I always kind of wondered about that. And there are, when you don't have the sun beating down on you and you don't have the physical influence of the sun, the challenge in your life or the challenge that you may have incarnated into is to create the sun yourself. Make your own sunshine. I think Serpent Power talks about this as well, the Arthur Avalon book, that we can learn to generate our own sunshine, or we can learn to um, invigorate our own body just using our internal forces and not referencing external sun at all. Now that is powerful. And um, there were actually certain uh, temple cultures or temple traditions that actually would go into the sort of darker, more northern latitudes because they believed that um, it would help them to actually sense their inner fire, their inner sun, and develop it themselves or develop it directly through their etheric body and they would get to know it in a very nuanced way because sometimes when you are surrounded by the sun all the time it almost becomes there's almost it's almost like a little bit easier and you're almost you can almost lean on it a little bit and sometimes it can be good to go and be in darkness like for example also, many initiation rites involve being in total darkness, total, total darkness, sometimes for three days or whatever. And this is so that the individual can get a sense of their inner light, their inner sun. Again, we don't want to be just getting all of our light externally. We're really here to be able to create that light inside of us. In order to do that, we need to be able to sense that inner light. And that, that takes experience. So what some mystery traditions would do is they would go into caves or temples where there was no light. They would be in there for a long period of time without the external light. In order to get a sense of their internal light, they would have to sense, they would have to face all of their demons. You have to earn your inner sunshine. You gotta face your demons. So you'd face the guardian at the threshold, you'd face your demons. And every every demon that you face, you'd get a sense of inner light. You get a sense of vivification directly from the sun but coming in through your etheric body, coming in cosmically to you. And then once you were in darkness, your pineal gland, your third eye would activate as well. And you're often led at the end of it all to receive a stream 
light. The new dawn. Your first stream of light would be but a sliver coming through a hole. That was a very powerful initiation ritual that was using the sun, but that was all about our inner sun and connecting with it. And what is that? How do I feel that? We have to earn it. You gotta face your demons. You gotta be in the dark. So if you live in a in a cloudy climate or, or a colder climate that doesn't have a lot of sun, you are there to develop your inner sun. That's what that's all about. And I actually feel like for me growing up in Canada and a lot of a lot of um a lot of my childhood was in northern um that's what I learned to do. You know, and it gets dark at, you know, two o'clock or whatever it is, like, or it's a, you know, midnight sun kind of thing. Um, you got to create that sunshine. You you, you got to create it yourself or you're going to, like, be so depressed. You got to learn how to create it yourself. And so there's a lot of power in darkness. There's a lot of power in not having the sun around because you don't rely on it. You don't depend on it. And there's something else that comes from it. So there's benefits to every type of position on the earth, whether it be at the equator, whether it be in darkness, there's a spiritual benefit to either one. It just depends on what your life purpose is. Is there a current Christ incarnation now? This is a really great question. It was prophesied that um, Christ would reincarnate. If you ask me, um, we are at another stage of the expression of Christ consciousness in which the energy in which Christ embodied is now going to beam down on us um, as a collective. We talked about earlier in this presentation, we talked about the idea of Akhenaten being a sun god and bringing everything kind of into one stream. And then previously, the kind of a more pagan or more varied god, goddesses, varied thing. We tend to go back and forth between an expanded, varied type of consciousness and then a singular one. And it's often the feminine and the masculine. Feminine and the masculine. So this is also part of how we receive Christ consciousness. Um, there will be a very significant individual, and then it will be... Um, uh, either varied or consciousness or more um, more of a consciousness, but also varied in the sense that there are going to be certain incarnations of individuals who were very formative to the earth and very formative to America. Um and very formative to Atlantis, and that were also very formative to Lemuria. So there, there, there were certain incarnations. I was talking about like certain solar deities coming. Well, when you incarnate, you often don't just incarnate once. It's, all, it's, all, it's usually a pattern of incarnations, and that's why people can predict when certain people are coming is because when you start being able to resonate very much a cosmic body, you start to be able to be predicted. And so there will be certain important incarnations that will return. And you could say that these incarnations are part of the mind of Jesus. They're part of the mind of Christ. That's what I would say. But there, we do have some important incarnations coming. Um, yes. Is it significant that Bill Gates wants to block the sun supposedly to save the earth? Yes, it is significant. It's significant because this is something that happens at the end of every cycle. There's always some individuals that are offended by the sun that want to change the sun. And to be completely honest, there are two different sort of streams of consciousness on the planet at this point. Well, there's many, but we're sort of going through a bifurcation where some people will genuinely perceive 
the sun as harmful and they're not at a level within their own consciousness and their own spirituality to receive it properly. And so they perceive the sun as being painful and toxic because for their energy body it is. And maybe even for certain technologies they have, they're no longer working properly anymore. So in their life experience and in their world, the sun is toxic for them, right? But other people um, who are able to move that prana in their body and channel energy and they've been evolving with the sun, they don't find the sun to be like a threat to them. They don't want to block it. So you see people who are wanting to, we're seeing people who basically, and Bill Gates is a good example of this. We are seeing people who basically want to change the earth and humanity into something else. They want to take the food and turn it into all GMO foods. They want to, you know, hook humanity up to machines and they think that the next stage for humanity is to literally turn them into a robot. Their bioenergetic field won't even be organic anymore. They don't want to just heal the wounds that exist within humanity and develop organically. They want to change humanity into something different. They don't want to just align with the sun and communicate with it and learn what it's saying and what it's doing and go back to the work of the ancients and evolve with it. They want to cloud it out. They want to block it. They want to run a, a, a machine like CERN and change the magnetism and energy around the planet. These are people that are playing God. Make no mistake. This is playing God. You're not aligning with humanity. Not once did you know, not once did Bill Gates ask people and say, so we all need the sun. We all want the sun. The sun's very important to us. It's the spiritual symbol. I think that I want to cover it up. I think I want to pop a big giant balloon and cover it up because I think it's dangerous. Did anybody ask you that? Were there any public discussions about it on your television? Did Bill Gates go to a town hall or a debate and submit his plan to a bunch of opposing scientists and individuals from various disciplines? Did he do this? This is the normal way in our society that we decide on big things. It has to go through rigorous debate where many opinions are, many different varied viewpoints are represented. And we make sure that these viewpoints are heard and something either passes or it doesn't. That is what we are supposed to be doing here in the West. We are not doing that. We've got Bill Gates off the rails in his go-kart doing the most bizarre things, buying up more farmland than anyone can own in Canada. He's got lawsuits against him that are basically... Um, in the Congo and Africa and India. So very, very, you know, like kind of being predatory towards these populations that got lawsuits because there were infertility. Um, last time I checked, there they were sterilization vaccines. You have no right to, to put that into a, I mean, this is the kind of sickness that we're looking at in society. You know, we have to be very, very careful of this. So. You know, there, there, there was also, I'm not sure if this is true, but there was also something about Bill Gates wanting to um, do something with, it's almost like I say these things and it's almost like these have to be lies. And then you research it and these are genuine things that are happening. But there was one where, you know, Bill Gates wanted to, I guess, buy seeds from a seed bank and turn them all into GMO. So like all of our seeds that are saved for like a rainy day for Armageddon. He wanted to take all those natural seeds and turn them into GMO seeds. You know, I haven't checked that one, so, um, but that's another thing that I heard. So we need to be really 
aware of these. And also, I mean, did, did Elon Musk ask us, did he go through town hall debates? Did he go through heavy criticism to put all of his satellites in the sky? Who has asked humanity? Nobody. There has been no robust discussion about any of this for people. Because most people would probably say, no, I can think of a better thing to do to help humanity along than these things. Okay. Is 5G connected to 5D? Well, they have the number five. I mean, maybe. I mean, 5G gets a lot of flack and people make fun of it, but the 5G, the, the 5G frequency was used as a military weapon. That's not a joke. That's reality. It's part of frequency warfare. So it is naive to think that we shouldn't question 5G. I mean, that is naivety to me. Um, and is 5G connected to 5D? I think if you wanted to connect it, I think you could do it through the work of the lady that did the space fence. Elena Freeland talks about how frequencies can be created that are low frequency or kind of trap consciousness in sort of a lower bubble, kind of like trap you, like the highest you can maybe go is the lower astral. It's all frequency. Everything is just frequency and energy. So maybe you could make an argument that certain frequencies, if built up and built up and, and installed everywhere or put around, maybe you could make an argument that it could cause some type of dome that really prevents 5D frequencies or sun energy from really hitting humanity. Maybe you could make an argument for that. I don't know enough about 5G. I'm not a very technical person, but I'm sure some people here are. Maybe we need to be careful with the frequencies that we're emitting on the planet. Maybe we don't know what, you know, we are frequency. We are a bioenergetic field, a frequency that are, that, that, that are radiating, that are, that's vibrating. Maybe we should consider what other frequency soups that we're swimming in because maybe they have an effect on our ability to process and receive the more higher dimensional forms of consciousness, like 5D, like light. Maybe we need to think about these things. Is it true that the earth is hollow with a sun in the middle? You know, it's funny. I would have, if you would have asked me this a while ago, I would have been like, oh, I don't know about that one. But I actually kind of, I, I don't know. I'm open. I've heard crazier things. Um, I read a book about Agartha, and it was an old book, and it actually talked about the sun and how the sun actually radiates to the core of the earth. So the sun obviously physically hits the earth, but there's also aspects of its rays that actually invigorate and vivify and centralize in the center of the earth. And this is connected to like volcanic activity and all sorts of earth changes because there's actually this basically like this inner sun in the inner earth that's communicating with our sun. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm a person who is completely open to that. The thing that I, I think that we do sometimes when we analyze information like this, even lore or mythologies, is we tend to think everything to be material. We, we, we become very materialized about it. Everything becomes physical. And I would argue that I think the inner earth is at a little bit of a different density. And I think it changes in density because I think it's pulling from the sun and other spheres. So I think the theory of the inner earth is a little bit more complex because I think there's layers of the inner earth that are a different density. And I think there's layers of the inner earth that are more physical. Do 
do all do all of the higher beings incarnated on the earth to help humanity with their initiation know who they are or is figuring that out part of their own initiation do they risk failure and fall this is such a great question no you don't know well there's different types of higher beings okay so you, you said incarnated yeah so if, if this is a higher being and by higher being in this sense we mean you are a soul that has achieved a certain level of initiation you've cleansed yourself of quite a bit of karma you can carry a high vibration within you and you're going to incarnate into a body and your own light remember we talked about this in the Christ stream lecture your own degree of inner light inner Sun if you will activates your own DNA so we can go through spiritual transformation by the power and the light of our soul okay so that's why the soul can basically kind of pick out from the genetics what it wants out of a huge field of genetic information so um do they know who they are i think that there's a distinct pattern um i think that you'll feel different I think that if you are here to be a teacher, you know, if you're a light worker, if you feel like you're in this category, I think you'll feel different. And I think that's the first sign of of that realization. You just feel different. You just look at things different. You feel different. You're the black sheep. And that's because you're literally your higher self, your mind, your consciousness is literally pulling from a different plane. It's pulling more from a different density than other people. You have a different perspective. And so you it feels like you kind of go against the grain. You feel weird. And, they, and that's your first initiation, is that you have to accept and love yourself even if you feel weird, even if you feel like you've been born into a family that does not get you and cannot reflect back who you are to you. Um, other times, uh, you know, very powerful souls will be born into families that do understand them or they'll have a very healthy environment. And that can also be very powerful too because you can generate a lot of power that way as well. But a lot of people with a higher energy find it challenging to be in the world today. And so that's the first indicator. Over time, they will have various different points of initiation in their life. They often come with cosmic initiation, things like the Saturn return, things every seven years. There's various different initiations we go through in our life as we move through the solar system with the planets. And these will temper us and condition us and we can choose to carry on with our missions or we can choose to back away a little bit and so we're very much defined by our choice to carry out our life purpose or or, or backing away from it and that is a choice that you will have in your life and you will have spirit guides and beings that are there with you to help you do what is in your best interest okay so figuring out who you are and investing in that is the best thing that you can do in your life. It's the best thing you can do in your life because that is your inner sun, your joy, your bliss, your passion. In a way, our, initi our, our greatest initiation in 3D, which is a realm of individuality, understanding what the collective is through understanding our individual part in it and feeling the feeling of being in a collective by knowing exactly what we can contribute with love exactly how we can serve and so understanding who you are and you know if, I, if anybody is watching this that is in their teens or that's in their 20s or even like parts of their 30s actually any age invest as early as possible, as soon as possible, in getting to know who you are. 
what you enjoy because that will carry you in your life. It is one of our greatest initiations is to have the courage to do that. Okay. Every, every type of um, higher being that incarnates here is subject to the same karmic waves or they're subject to the same sort of psychic pressure that everybody else is just because a higher being or you know a higher initiate incarnates here it doesn't mean that they're immune to everything going on they will experience it if not more so because of the sensitivity and because of that it will be a test for them and there are there have been spiritual teachers who were wonderful in the beginning and somewhere along the lines, they lost themselves, they lost their purpose, they forgot their oaths, they forgot what they were doing, and they lost themselves. So you can definitely um, abandon your purpose, and you can definitely, definitely fail. Um, like I said, when we were talking about the Lords of Venus, or the, you know, higher beings that come here, this is an initiation for them too. They're challenged. You know, this is, this, it's not, you know, they can fail or they can do well. And sometimes when you start getting into these conversations about like Anunnaki or these various beings that are very bad, and then there's ones that are very good, maybe even getting into the Gnostic idea of the Demiurges or things like that. You know, we're starting to get into the realization that maybe on this planet, We've had several cycles of beings that have come here um, from another sphere to initiate us into a higher way of life. And not everyone that's made that journey here has remained in their purity. Not everybody that came that was of that higher world maintained that over the many, many, many different dramas and energies that they go through being incarnated here. They didn't choose it. They regressed and they fell. And that actually is part of why our world has so many problems. You think about the kind of technologies that, are, that, that, that exist and various things that have gone on and various battles that go on and things like that. It starts to make a lot of sense if we can have this bigger picture where we do have certain people, certain beings that you could call interdimensionals, you could call them future humans or humans from different timelines that have, you know, come here and contributed. But again, not all of them are able to stay pure or stay true to what they wanted to do. And so it gets very messy, it gets very complicated. And here we are. Okay. Did the Egyptian pyramids and items like the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant harness the sun's energy like a battery? Yeah, it did. It really, they, they really did. Now the Ark of the Covenant, I did hear that it was like gold and gold is a special resonance with the sun. And maybe it had like a two eye crystal in it, or maybe it had like some kind of crazy thing in it that resonated with the sun. Because like I said earlier, we know that in Atlantis, the crystals resonated with the sun. And a lot of the energy and power has to do with the sun. Um, the devices that we can create, process solar energy and whatnot. So. The Egyptian pyramids and items like the, the, the Egyptian pyramids definitely work with solar energy, but also like cosmic energy. Um, and the Egyptian py pyramids were always a place of initiation. I mentioned an initiation ritual earlier about being in total darkness and being in light. And, and these are all very... I, I believe that, yeah, they're all very solar technologies. And any ritual or any temple 
especially if you go back into the ancients, they all usually have some kind of relationship with the sun. They do the moon too. They definitely include the moon. The moon is a certain counterpoint to the sun. It provides um, that counterpoint energy um, and certain meaning to the sun's energy. We reference it for meaning and, and it's definitely there. But there's a special power with the sun that a lot of temples will have and we can even see that with things like Stonehenge that have the sun go through it on the solstice. Um, you have cathedrals that will have the sun beam down into certain areas. You have examples of, you know, the buildings that the Templars built where they would have little holes and the sunbeams would come in and it would shine down on a fountain or a pool or this is very this is very similar to Atlantean style temple building it's the same thing and um, the same thing with pyramids so there are people who know all about the sun the question that I'm going to leave you with today is what do you think of the sun what do you think what do you think of solar beings? What do you think of Christ consciousness? What do you think of the sun changing? What do you think of the sun's pattern of connection with us over many different eras? What do you think? Anyway, that went by so fast for me. I've absolutely loved being here with you guys today. If you guys sat with me for this full what is it, four hours? I'm so grateful. It was my absolute pleasure. As always, all my love your way, and I will see you next week for our live Q&A.